because it's 7 o'clock. And uh, I want to welcome everyone to the uh, council regular meeting of September 17th, 2018. And Judy, could you please do the roll call? Yes. Housh. Yes. McQueen. Here. Hempfling. Here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Here. Also present are village manager Patty Bates. Village Solicitor Chris Connor, Chief of Police Brian Carlson, and Director of Public Works Johnny Burns, and Planning and Zoning Administrator Denise Swinger. All right, thank you. Uh, so I believe uh, next on our agenda is one of our favorite things, is swearing in a new team member. And uh, if Mayor Canine will uh, lead the proceedings. Yes, we need, we need a good picture. I'm pleased to introduce to the crowd Elise Burns, who is our new clerk of court taking over from Ann Portinga, who sadly was leaving, somewhat overwhelmed with her responsibilities. <laughs> and uh, at any rate, we're very happy to have Elise with us picking up where Ann left off. So, Elise, would you raise your right hand? I. Elise Burns solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution and obey the laws of the United States and of the State of Ohio, and that I will in all respects observe the provisions of the Charter and the ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs and will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Clerk of Courts. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Clerk of Courts. Thank you. There he is. There he is. <laughs> All right. Welcome, Elise. And um, we're going to move into uh, announcements. Anyone have any announcements? Oh, we have the, we have the uh, oh. water treat. What's happening here? Well, oh, I just had a dump of all my papers off the side. <laughs> Thank you. You're very gracious. Just leave them down there. <laughs> the water treatment plant ribbon cutting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's going to happen Tuesday, which is tomorrow, mm -hmm. at 10 a.m. at our water plant. And everyone is invited. It will be very exciting. And uh, if you don't know where the water treatment plant is, you just go down 68 to Jacoby Road and turn left and keep going until you can't go anymore, just about. Let's see a sign for it. It's the, oh, no, I had one other one. Mm. The Ohio Housing Finance Agency conference is happening November 6th through the 8th. I'm planning on attending. I'm hoping Denise can attend. I know Karen Swinger is going to attend. Anyone who's interested in housing, uh, See me if you're interested in attending. Oh, and one other. The Home Inc. Progressive Dinner is happening on Saturday, November 3rd, and you can go to the Home Inc. website to purchase tickets. Or you could uh, see Jackie Anderson you right in the back of the Jackie room. see Jackie Anderson in the back of the room. All right. Uh, Lisa, any announcements? No. Um, okay, well, I did want to mention the uh, John Bryan uh, Community Gallery uh, is going to be having a uh, opening reception on September 27th, so that's uh, a week from Thursday, and um, it's going to be from six to nine. Uh, there's some amazing art that's out already that's really highlighting our uh, local uh, creative culture, and uh, we're going to also have Joseph Glenn, our steel drummer. Uh, entertaining us uh, as well as uh, the usual kind of uh, uh, re reception sort of fair. So uh, please come and uh, celebrate uh, the John Bryan Community Gallery. Um, Judith? Yeah, um, I wasn't quite sure how to do this, so this is the way I'm doing it. Uh, <laughs> um, I just wanted to let everybody know I'm going to need to come off of council before the end of my term, which is another year. Um, uh, I feel, you know, I feel a little bad. I'm not making it the full four years, but um, for personal reasons, I feel the need to do that. So I was hoping to complete some things before I go, um, and uh, was thinking it would take the council a couple months to replace me. Uh, and that doesn't mean I won't be engaged in some things. But um, 
what I was hoping is maybe by the end of November I would step off. I do want to see uh, wherever we make a decision on the Justice System Commission that that be complete. I would like to kind of finish up with the diversity hiring practices that we've been working on. Um, and I know I'll be involved with the affordable housing stuff. Uh, if we do develop, if we do set a new justice system commission, I would be interested to be on as a citizen. And that's about it. Mm. So. That was sudden. Sorry to hear that. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sure all will go well. It's been great working with everybody and you know doing the work, but um, it's hard to know when you run and you have four years ahead of you. You know what sort of things may. That's my excuse for not making it the full four years. Mm. All right. um, Patty? Um, well, we have open that. First of all, Judith, thank you for your service. Um, and my announcement is to just wish Solicitor Chris Connor a belated happy birthday. Ah, wow. Since I, since I missed birthday. it at the last What number is it? 60. <laughs> Such a baby. Wow. So, he's a baby. You don't look at, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, yeah, it's, I'm sure it's the village keeping you young. Um, Brian, I do yes. have something a uh, resident just reminded me, someone in the audience reminded me that the Get Out the Vote rally will be at Anyak College Sunday afternoon at 2. Monica, you can stand up and say these things too. Uh, but yeah, I don't have the details, but 2 o'clock uh, at the Curtis Scott King Center, actually in the, in the Oval, in the Horseshoe, in the Horseshoe, yeah. Yeah, oh, good to have the Horseshoe, I mean the Wellness Center <laughs> as a backup. But yeah, thank you, Monica, for that reminder. Um, yeah, and I just want to say, uh, Judith, I'm still kind of a little floored, honestly, but uh, um, I really appreciate that you are willing to stay engaged um, in the same way that I've appreciated Karen Wintrow and Jerry Sims being on commission. So, uh, um, so anyway, uh, I, I will just say we'll continue to work together. Um, okay, uh, so um, on the consent agenda, did we have any other announcements? Sorry. Um, consent agenda, we've got the minutes from the September 4th uh, regular meeting. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, and then now t a review of the agenda. Um, anything that uh, uh, needs yeah. to be revised? I yes. I have a couple things. Well, I'm. <laughs> I haven't gotten over this, but I think we should have on new business to say something about a process of okay. replacing Judy. Um, and I have a suggestion that we put the ordinance 33 and 37, both of which uh, deal with the tree commission, so we put them one after the other. Okay. And there are several uh, petitions and communications that I think may take a little time to talk about. Three of them actually will probably involve council talking about them. So I don't know. I think I'll talk about that during that, but it would mean potentially more time on the agenda. Okay. Well, I think specifically if we're talking about the uh, home ink request. Um, I would propose that we put that on for at least a brief discussion in new business. Okay. I, don't, I don't know if we'll make a decision, but. Um, I was going to recommend we, is there a time frame on this? If there's not, I was thinking we should put it on the agenda, the coming agenda. Yeah, that I. Because it's a substantial I agree, unless, I mean, there are discussion. Well, well, they could we speak, to, to, speak it. to it. Yeah. But in terms of us approving it, I would. Say okay. Well, it can also be if it's not going to be on the agenda. Just um, under they can citizen, speak citizen concern. concerns. Yeah. All right. I, that's no that's fine with me. Okay. And Lisa. Yeah, I I would like to remove resolution 2018-38 from the agenda this evening. Um, there was a process involving a group of stakeholders, including members of the. Um, Mayor Task Force Subcommittee of the Justice System Task Force and myself uh, that were involved in the original draft 
and we weren't involved in the revision. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's important to reconvene with that original group. I note the solicitor's report, but as the council person, I was left out of that revision and I feel like we need to recon con reconvene to understand the basis of the changes. Okay, so I see Judith nodding. Uh, council members are okay with that? Okay, good. Anything else? Okay, so then um, if not, let's move into petitions and communications. Marianne? Yes, um, we got an announcement from uh, Green County Health Department that September is uh, Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Disorders Awareness Month. And I don't think I need to say how important it is uh, for women who are pregnant not to drink alcohol. Uh, then the next is Judith uh, Hempling had a, uh, put in announcements uh, wanting to discuss employee evaluations. And I think you would ask for five minutes, is that right? Uh, that would be great, yeah, under new, under um, old business or new business. Or well, we're, it looks like our agenda maybe is getting a little shorter, but my sense was that to ha this is something that could go on, I mean, deserves a fair amount of time. I'm not sure five minutes is even enough to introduce. I guess I'd okay. suggest it, maybe. It, and, yeah, and, and we're talking about the evaluations. Correct? Yeah, yes. and I and I was on vacation last week and was not aware that I needed to. Have yeah, a, that's that's why I thought just to. Yeah, yeah I don't know and, if we should even go on. I wanted to get it just in the, in our. So do you? Yeah. So you'll just sort of. You want? Do you want to? Well, what, what I'd like to. We suggest, could just add it to the next agenda. Yeah, maybe. I have so many different projects that I'm involved in with council members. If any council member would like me to report out on one and you let me know, I'm happy to put it in my manager's report for the next meeting. It might be the most expedient way. And then if council feels then that they need to pull it out as a discussion item for that particular topic, that, that would help. Because that way I, I know that I need to get with the staff and get updates and uh, okay. on all of these. So we can put it on the next agenda? Yeah, I think it should be on the agenda, though, because, um, yeah, I think it should not just be in the... Right. Okay. So, so we'll next, does that make sense? Yeah, for the next meeting. Yep. And this is around, you know, our staff evaluations and um, just, you know, our standards, how we're trying to make sure we're meeting best practices. Okay. Then the next one was um, two uh, connected reports from the Justice System Task Force regarding citizen review boards and advisory boards, research done on that. I believe that that is a critical issue that deserves a fair amount of time, discussion, and counsel. It sort of comes with Lisa's proposal. I don't know how we want to handle it today, but I, it, it, I had requested that it come to council because I think it's something people in the community have been interested in. It's critical and it's also complex, and I think it needs to be discussed at council. So. Um, and I noticed that Pat Deweese is here. I, I would. I thought it was background for future discussion. Well, uh, right. I mean, it may be a part of our discussion about the commission. It may be a part of our discussion about the uh, advisory board proposal. Um, it, but I agree. I think uh, there are a couple things that are probably going to be continuing discussions. Okay. Um, I had thought our our uh, our agenda was so full that. It would be great for Pat to be able to report out on that report. I think it's a great report. It's really well done. She is reporting out tonight on the biannual report uh, under special reports. And I don't know if she'd be, I don't know if, I mean, we're going to be bringing, you know, basically presenting on a proposal about a commission. <coughs> and Lisa uh, has added an agenda item on citizen advisory board proposal. And it really is background material, particularly, I think. Well, for both. Mm -hmm. So um, if we had time tonight and Pat was up for it to, to report out on it, I don't know how you feel well, about I'm that. Assuming people read it. Well, we have read it. I mean, I hope we have read it. Uh, but, but just to do, make some highlights. It would be, it would yeah. be a beginning. 
Yeah. So if there's time, I think it would be great if we could just add well, it. Well, it's relevant to the biennial report. So, Fair. Pat, anything you want to highlight and any questions that council has, I think that sounds great. Um, okay. okay. And then the last uh, communication was the Home Inc. Capital Campaign request. Uh, and so I assume some Home Inc. members came because of that. So if we say that they can they can speak at uh, citizens' concerns, and then we'll put request to have it put on the agenda for a discussion and approval at the next meeting. OK. That means you guys get out of here earlier. All right. Um, anything else, Marion? No. OK. Uh, so we are going to move into public hearings and legislation. And Judy, if you could read ordinance 2018-30 in by title only. Amending the official zoning map of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, for the property located at 117 East North College Street, parcel, I'm skipping that part, on 0 0.905 acres from E1 Educational, I'm sorry, EI Educational Institutions to RC High Density Residential District. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right. Um, and uh, a reminder. Uh, Kevin Stokes recused himself uh, at the last meeting when we discussed this, and so that's why he's out in the audience. Denise? Okay. At the last, <clears throat> at the last meeting uh, for the first reading, um, council obviously had overwhelming support for this. Um, since then, the Planning Commission held a conditional use meeting um, and um, did ask for one uh, request within this ordinance um, and that was, um, there is a section, uh, a separate property that abuts um, this, where this development will be. It's um, in your packet is lot 3A. And there is a partial area that has some blacktop on it. And they would like to see that, and this would be at, at Antioch's, when, at, a, at a point in time when Antioch College can do this with the least amount of cost to them when there's already heavy equipment there anyway, doing the pocket neighborhood development in the, in the parking area, if they could remove the asphalt that's on lot 3A just to create a little bit more of a barrier um, for a green space between the neighborhoods. And so that has been reflected in this or ordinance, if you accept that. OK. Um, well, I was just about to say, since this is the second reading, I'm going to open the public hearing. And Marianne, did you want to? Yeah, well, I've lived on that street for decades. And frankly, I don't think it makes much difference whether it's removed or not. But I do think that it makes sense for Antioch to be able to have the blacktop available for construction material, construction equipment during the construction. So I just want to make sure that there's no uh, no requirement that they remove that before the project is completed. And they, and they actually talked about that, that they could um, <coughs> allow them to, you know, use that area for staging when it was the right time for them. And it's not a financial burden on them. Okay. Um, you that's that's absolutely that? right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Great. Um, any other questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right. If not, I'm going to close the public hearing. And Judy, if you could uh, call the roll. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Hempling. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Housh. Yes. OK. Um, next, we have Ordinance 2018-33. And um, yes, please come back in, Kevin. We do not want to rec you to recuse yourself for this. Um, and Judy, if you could read it in full. Sure, this is enacting new chapter 1023 entitled Trees of the Codified Ordinances of the, Yellow, of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Whereas counsel for the Village of Yellow Springs in conjunction with the village manager and with the Yellow Springs Tree Committee have determined to apply for Tree City USA status as a means of formalizing and furthering the work of the Tree Committee. And whereas as a necessary step towards becoming a Tree City USA, the Village of Yellow Springs must establish both a tree commission and guidelines to direct that commission. And whereas the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs believes that it has determined, 
believes, has determined, it is in the best interest of the village to codify regulations as it relates to public and private trees as a necessary step in becoming Tree City USA. Now, therefore, counsel for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that section one, a new section 1023 entitled Trees is hereby enacted to read as set forth in the attached exhibit A, which is incorporated herein, and section two, this ordinance shall become effective at the earliest period allowed by law. Okay, can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right, um, Patty, is this you? This is me. So this is the first step in uh, becoming a tree city, which is a status that council has expressed a desire to apply for. Um, this particular ordinance governs the care of the trees and the, the forest canopy in the village. Um, it does have, it's primarily public trees. You will see references to private trees in there, especially when there are dangers. Um, and it sets forth the guidelines under which the tree commission, which will be established by a separate ordinance, will operate. Um, the one thing that you should be aware of, and I pointed this out in my manager's report, is that this does say in the ordinance that the village is responsible for public trees. Now, public trees are defined, right of way is defined. We made very, made very sure that these things were defined in here. This is the current practice that we have, is that a public tree is under the care of the village. So if there's a public tree that needs to be pruned, removed, that kind of thing, then it's on the village. Um, and those determinations are made basically on a case-by-case -case basis because the right-of-way varies on streets throughout the village, depending on the street, how wide it is, et cetera. Um, that is the primary way that villages that are, cities and villages that are tree cities do this. It's not the only way to do it, but it is formally putting the financial responsibility on the village and you need to be aware of that. And just to be clear, that's the current practice after is, three years, right? That, that is the current practice. Okay. And um, we do have, <clears throat> excuse me, a financial obligation if we become a tree city to spend at least $2 per capita. Um, which we already do. Which we already do if you count all of the trimming and everything else that we do. We spend that easily. Um, so, you know, it's not really a change in what we do, but council should make, you know, we will make sure in the future that we have designated funds in the budget that will go for this purpose. Because right now it just comes out of the general fund as part of our care of our properties. Right. And I definitely, I'm an advocate for us being clear about, you know, what we're budgeting, you know, for because um, I know, you know, there's just tree maintenance we have to do. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we emphasize that, you know, and this was, you know, it was talked about in the uh, tree committee's letter that this is not about the accolade for Tree City USA, but it's about formalizing our collaborative partnership um, around making sure that we're properly caring for our trees. And, and I think it's really important, you know, as we plan for these things as a village that we do that. Right, and, and that's a good point, Brian, because, you know, some of the problems that we have with our street trees right now have to do with the wrong species being planted in the wrong place. And that's another thing that this commission will be active in is saying these are acceptable trees for the tree lawn, for instance, which is the space between the sidewalk and the street. You definitely don't want to put huge trees there because huge trees are just going to lift up your sidewalks. But there are trees that you can put there that will provide shade, will provide you know, forest canopy that aren't going to lift up the sidewalk. Those kind of things and setting those down in writing will be something that the Tree Commission will be actively involved in determining. And we do have Macy and Anna here if anyone has any questions of the Tree Committee as it stands today will continue to exist and they plan on being actively involved and to continue to help raise funds to go towards this program as well. Yeah, I guess I have a question. So the tree committee, will the tree committee and a tree commission? Yes, the tree committee will continue as a private nonprofit, which is what they are now. Um, and they will work in conjunction with the tree commission with volunteering, helping to raise funds, that kind of thing. I'm thrilled that we're, do that we're doing this. I think it's great. <clears throat> we have uh, beautiful trees in our town and it's one of the 
special things about Yellow Springs is all the beautiful trees. And I love that Patty, uh, our village manager, has this passion for trees, and she's <laughs> putting forward this proposal. I think it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And just to say, from the point of view of energy use, it's, you know, it's a big positive in terms of keeping. I mean, uh, when I, I work in Dayton sometimes, and when I'm sitting over there, and it's about five degrees, six degrees hotter than it is, you know, here, Sometimes uh, it's just, I mean, I'm wondering about, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, just to be conscious of how much cooler it is in our village in the hot days of summer because of all the shade we have. It can be significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have air conditioning, and it's because of that tree canopy. <laughs> um, any other questions or comments from council? Yeah. Yes, and I've got some stuff too. Um, well, I don't support it. <laughs> Here I am, an environmental commission liaison. I love trees. I mean, uh, trees are what, if anything, well, nothing will save us from climate change, but trees are the critical part. What concerns me, and I'll use this as a, an example for the rest of the meeting, we, we have seven major projects that council is now saying it's going to undertake, this being one. I, and I didn't understand there'd be a tree committee and a tree commission. To me, that seems redundant. But every time we have a commission, that means we have to get people on the commission. It means that we have to have all the legislation. It means there's extra staff work. It means there's extra expense. And it means that council has more work. So we're talking about having a tree commission, a justice system commission. We have the housing initiative, which is going to only get more work, not less. We have the designated Community Improvement Corporation, which is going to be a big deal, hopefully. Possibly a Citizens Advisory Board. The Village Manager CERT process, which is critical. And a budget in an atmosphere where we're being told by the, the community that affordability is maybe the biggest <coughs> problem in the community. So I really think we need to be not taking on more stuff. I think we need to be doing what we're supposed to be doing and trying to do it a little better. So I love trees. I, at this point, I do not support having a tree commission, and I don't really see any value in being a tree city USA. Lisa? Um, so I uh, agree with you, Marianne, and at the same time was very um, compelled by the presentation given by the tree committee that expressed their concerns about sustainability and the time and people are getting older and the amount of work that it takes. And I just wondered, is there a, a hybrid approach that would shore up the, the tree committee and help with capacity for the tree committee to achieve this same kind of a goal of caring for trees, which we already do, is what I'm hearing from a budget standpoint, without creating another commission. I don't know if there is a, some kind of a way to do that. Is there a way to achieve the objectives that are good without creating another commission that causes capacity issues? That's my concern as well. I, 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 I'll, I'll just piggyback onto that because one thought I had at one point was having it be a subcommittee of the Environmental Commission, which we already have one subcommittee, but the Environmental Commission seems to me would be the appropriate liaison if there were some kind of <laughs> liaison relationship. I, w I was imagining, because we know Patty is um, retiring a, a year or less, less, a little bit less um, and that she was staying in town, <laughs> that uh, she would take the lead and you know we have this thing where <laughs> at least to get it off the ground but the thing about it is tree there's a lot of people who love trees in the village and sometimes people are looking for a way to plug in so it is another way to plug in and um, we have this thing for commissions there always has to be a council liaison which means we're going to extra meetings and I think we might want to consider uh, we don't have to, maybe we don't need a liaison to every committee, you know, something like that. But anyway, I don't know if Patty's planning to stay in the village, you know, for the next several years and could help play a leadership role there. But she, was, she was planning my retirement. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it's just a thought, but I was kind of imagining. 
I was imagining since Patty, this is Patty's proposal, that um, maybe there's a way to do it. Maybe we need to think about it a little bit more how that might be, because council's got its hands full for sure, uh, and staff has its hands full for sure. So we, so partly we think of it as being more work, and partly commissions are supposed to give us extra capacity. So it's kind of that seems to be the question. You know, the the question could it give us more capacity? That actually means less work. That's you know. Mm -hmm. So we. So we have now, or we do sometimes take advantage of village manager advisory groups that sort of provide capacity but don't have all the overhead, if you will, for a commission. You meet as needed. <clears throat> Excuse me. You don't uh, have all the um, administrative requirements in terms of uh, recording uh, and documenting uh, in Sunshine Law. So. That's an option, I think, that sort of addresses, <clears throat> excuse me, the hybrid nature of thing, especially in that there's still going to be a tree committee uh, where all the brain power exists. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, a great deal of leadership will be there. So, you know, I don't think we need to necessarily add as much to it to keep it going and established. And, and I guess the, a big question is what are the requirements, you know, for being tree city? USA. I mean, if we need to start there and say, well, what are the minimum requirements? You know, can this pseudo governmental advisory group, along with the tree committee, uh, check all the boxes? The answer to the last question is no. If you're going to be a tree city, one of the four requirements are that you have a formal tree commission. There, there are actually, there's that. The two dollars per capita, a tree ordinance, and, and I an Arbor two, Day and an Arbor Day celebration. Thank yes. you. I have too many stacks of papers. Um, um, so, if you want to go first, I'll, I have my other stuff written down. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I do want. Um, yes. Would well, you want to speak for? Well, the the yeah. other thing I'm going to say is, as far as from where I sit and my staff sits, I'm not sure that there's a difference between a manager's advisory committee and a commission. Um, it's still the same amount of work for us. Um, we probably get things done a little bit more quickly just because we don't have to wait for the next meeting. Um, but you're, you would still have the budgetary consequences that Mary Ann has expressed a concern about and Lisa. Um, so I, I'm not sure that that would accommodate the hybrid. If, you know, if the village, and let's back up just a little bit. Originally, this proposal was something that Anna and I had talked about. Anna came and said they had their concerns about the tree committee, um, the sustainability of the tree committee, the fact that they weren't, didn't seem to be able to recruit the younger members. Um, the tree committee does raise their fund, their own funds. They take her a lot of the stuff out at the Arboretum, which is huge, um, and we appreciate greatly. Um, but that, that was where the idea came from. Um, as Judith pointed out, I am a forester by trade, uh, undergraduate, so yes, I love trees. But um, Johnny, do you want to, I, I, from where I sit, the tree city designation is a nice thing. It's a good thing to have. It's beneficial. This does put some formal structure to how trees will be handled. Um, if you choose not to become a tree city, can we still put formal structure to how street trees are going to be handled? Yeah, we sure can. Um, okay. Go ahead, Kevin. How, how often does the tree committee meet? And four, times a year. four times a year. And, and if, did you want to? Did you want to say something? Yeah. Okay. Come yeah. on up. And the tree commission, if you go this route, would have to meet six times a year. Okay. Wow. Um, okay. I know it's a, a concern. The, the workload is a concern for the for the um, for the village council, but there's there's other people involved in this too, and mostly through the director of public works and his crews. One of the things that would really be enhanced by having this, this uh, ordinance and a tree commission is that 
there'll be crystal clear instructions and communication between the tree committee and the tree commission, tree commission and the director of public works. Mm -hmm. Right now, every time we want to plant a tree, we have to go to Johnny and say, look at this spot and see if that works. It's very inefficient. This would make everything so much more efficient, not just for him, but also for us on the tree committee. And, um, and it would really enhance our work a lot. So if, if you can see your way clear to uh, passing this ordinance, the ordinances that are involved here, it would really be beneficial for everybody. Uh, we're all interested and concerned about the trees in Yellow Springs, and, and they need more attention than what we've been able to give them as a tree committee. This would make it so much better and so much easier. As far as I know, if, if we follow the ordinance that we've proposed, it won't involve but more than one person on the, on the village council, plus additional members on the commission from other sources, some of the tree committee, of course. Uh, so the work should be much, much more efficient because we're communicating directly and we're following ordinances instead of just making up rules as we go along. All right, okay. thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do wish we had had uh, the letter that you guys wrote that talked about um, that there's a collaboration here. It's not just a burden, you know, for the village. Um, but I do think it's really important that regardless of how we decide on this commission, we do need structure around um, removal and planting of trees mm -hmm. because it is critical to our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have to have some involvement in that. So. You know, again, the accolade, you know, I, I just want to emphasize that that's not what this is about, but formalizing some kind of structure, and I do want to hear what Johnny thinks about this, mm -hmm. I think is, you know, something that we need to think about seriously. And West South College is, you know, something that we can't do anything about until those trees are retired, for example, to make that a safer street. Mm -hmm. Well, I have yes. a partial suggestion. Sometimes it seems like we don't really understand what the problem is before we create the solution. And to me, this might be an example of this. I think it might behoove us to really define with the tree committee and Johnny and Patty, what, what is the problem, what are the problems, and then look at what's gonna be the most effective way to have a solution with the, the least overlap and the least amount of work. And, and what I am thinking about some of these other things in this list of seven things is that I'm wondering if we could, uh, I guess, sort of table some things until the beginning of next year and then uh, have council assess what are our priorities, what do we have time for, what does staff have time for, what do we have resources for, and make hard decisions rather than just keep starting new commissions and new projects. Mm -hmm. So I just want to point out um, that Tree City applications go in annually. They're due by December 1st. So if we delay, I'm not saying yay or nay either way on whether we do or don't delay. If we delay, um, it would be next year before you would apply to be a Tree City to become a Tree City in 2020. So just so everyone is aware of that particular deadline. Go ahead, Lisa. Uh, so um, I, uh, for me, the tree city designation is not the most important thing. It's the care of the trees. It's that there's clear um, rules and ordinances about how trees are cared for. And I mean, I think that the language is really important in having clear rules. And I understand the need to increase capacity for the tree committee. So I, I really like Marianne's idea um, because it lets us really scope the issue. I think that um, I would be in support. I'm just the most worried about creating another commission, not about creating clarity um, about responsibilities and how trees are cared for. Well, it, they are in here as two separate ordinances. So council could choose to pass the tree ordinance and just not create a tree commission. Mm -hmm. That puts mm -hmm. the responsibility still on the village. Collaboration could continue with the tree committee. 
uh, on a regular basis, as it does now. Johnny goes to the meetings with them. Um, so if that is what, if, if the primary goal here is the structure, which I agree is probably the most important part, that may be something the council wants to consider is passing this particular ordinance, but not necessarily creating the tree commission. Okay. I, I would make a, a motion that we table the commission, the commission proposal, and then we can explore these other things and decide whether that's the right way to go. Okay. Well, and actually, I mean, we are talking about, even though commission is in this mm -hmm. ordinance, we're talking about the, you know, I mean, this is the ordinance about tree mm -hmm. maintenance. Um, so are you wanting to table? Well, I ordinance? just wonder if we need to get a little more information. Okay. Before we make a decision can, about the whole thing, have, rather than trying to split it out. I don't right. know. Right. Can we have Johnny say yeah. a few words? Um, <clears throat> but then I do think we'll wrap this up. I'm both ways. Uh, <laughs> I've been this way since uh, Patty and I talked about it. <clears throat> what I don't want to see is more work put on the staff. Uh, that's my number one goal. Do I think we need it? I think we do a pretty good job now that we communicate very well. Uh, but we also need to get some more structure involved. I've asked Patty, what, what happens if we go with the tree, tree city and let's say let's fast forward and all of a sudden we don't have a lot of volunteers. Where does that put us as staff? Because I'll give you an example. We decided not to plant this year and Public Works got 60 some acres to mow in Bush Hall because we decided not to plant in the crops. So a decision was made which cost us in the long run by the lack of hours to be able to do such tasks. So I'm torn either way. I'm, I'm, I'll go either way that the commission or the council wants us to go. I just would like to emphasize, like some of you have, uh, staff is thin and we have a lot of stuff to do and we're already doing a job with the trees. We're, I'm already working with the tree committee. And just to get it as another commission or another organization, I, don't, I, I personally don't support it. I've told Patty that since the beginning. I was worried about the staffing issue. If I can be guaranteed it is not going to become a staffing issue five years down the road, then I'm 100% behind it. But I don't want it to become a staffing issue. Do you agree, Johnny, that the structure that would be provided by an ordinance telling people not to necessarily plant things in the right of way in the tree? I, I do agree with that, but I think that's something that can be done in-house and, and working with the tree committee and working with council and working with the village staff. I don't think that we have to go out to another source and create another commission just to do something that can be fine-tuned in-house. So if, if we were to table this particular ordinance, which is the care of trees, and go through it, take out the references to the commission, and, and then make sure that it is the structure that we're looking for, that would be... I would be fine with that. And review it with the tree committee? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, they've been actively involved yes. in, the, in, in the design of it. And, and I agree that I need to be a, with them 100% because where they plant trees, for me, is a big concern. Right. Power lines, water lines, sewer lines, because I don't want to go back to them in, in 10 years and say, hey, by the way, you're, you're weeping willows down in my sewer or storm line, and now we've got to dig up somebody's whole backyard because we wasn't part of that. I, I agree with that 100%. So I do think that we all need to work together. I just don't know that we need to be set in stone that that needs to happen. Um, I think we can do it as an ordinance. As okay, as thanks, village. Johnny. All right. So, okay, I will emphasize that I think it's very important that we lock down our policy around trees, particularly tree removal, but also tree maintenance. Um, I you know, I'm fine with us, uh, you know, thinking later about whether a commission or a committee or planning commission or environmental commission is what we need for capacity. But I think it's very important that we remember the bigger picture here is that this is about infrastructure, mm -hmm. all right? This is not just, you know, uh, it's nice to have a tree, all right? Not to mention that it, it 
delivers on our goals around our reducing our carbon footprint, which is something that Judith mentioned before. So um, I would like to take the first stab at revising the commission thing because I had a list of, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the, uh, the maintenance, tree maintenance piece. Um, but I guess I'd also like us to be open to uh, remembering why the tree committee thought a commission or some formal <laughs> capacity group made sense. Because what I'm hearing Patty say is that there's an efficiency aspect, which Anna also emphasized. Um, but, I, but I'm comfortable with uh, tabling this and bringing back a different kind of ordinance. So second it. OK. All those in favor? <laughs> Signify what, by, or, that, what are we so I made a tabling. motion to uh, uh, table and bring back a, a different kind of ordinance. So tabling I, both, we're not tabling it. We're writing a new ordinance. Okay, so we're just uh, all right. So we're, I guess, voting. Uh, well, we can table this and you can rework it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think what you're saying, Judy, is we should just call a vote. Uh, no, or, you're done. You're done. Don't have to do anything. Get an okay, cool. All right. So and this so is um, to replace uh, place 33. 33. Correct. Correct. Okay. okay. Uh, and that's what you're going to. Yes. Um, I just wanted to comment because you mentioned Southwest College Street, which has those beautiful old trees. <coughs> and talking about the conflict between those beautiful old trees and infrastructure is what I heard. Is that what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Right. They're, and, they're oh, say, George. Yeah. Catalpa. I'm sorry. Catalpa. Are they Catalpa? No, no, they're not ashes. So, they're Catalpa or Osage, George. I forgot which. Anyway, I just, when we're thinking about conflicts between infrastructure and trees, when they're quite old, beautiful trees, I think we should be thoughtful about it, I guess. Right. And, and I want to emphasize I'm not talking about removing those trees okay. until they've passed. But then once those trees, you know, have reach their lifespan, then we have opportunities to think about um, different sidewalks and trails and better streets and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, what, that's what, to me, this policy is about, is making sure we make good decisions. And that's why I do want council to be involved and maybe planning commission is, is appropriate for this as well. Okay. Um, so that means we will not need to worry about the other tree commission ordinance, I think. That's correct. Um, and so that brings us. What, what are we doing with that? We're we just tabling it or just setting it aside for now? Or I don't know what the difference is. I mean, probably. Tabling is usually for the period of one meeting. So I would say that you're just taking it off the agenda. S setting and it aside for it. It's going away until at a later point if you want to bring it back. The numbers will change, the content will change. So. And do we need a motion to take it off the agenda or? No, I don't believe so. You can just pass it over. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so then we will next look at Ordinance 2018-36. And Judy, title only, please. Yeah, this is repealing Section 452.20, Parking of Trucks and Construction Equipment of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 452.20, Parking of Trucks, Construction Equipment, and Recreational Vehicles. Okay. Can I get a motion? So moved. moved. Second. All right. Denise? Hi. Um, so this is really outside of the planning and zoning section of the code, but the um, uh, Planning Commission discussed for a while um, some concerns that um, I brought to them about uh, RV parking in the public rights right away, and it's been a concern also of the Public Works Department, especially for snow removal and other types of uh, issues within the street, uh, visibility, et cetera. Um, I, I met with, uh, the plan, uh, with the police department and um, they agreed as well with the idea of just not allowing recreational vehicle parking in the public right of ways. Now what that means, we also have it in our zoning code which we'll be bringing up to you later. We're not changing anything in the zoning code, we still allow parking of recreational vehicles on private property. Um, we still allow recreational vehicles um, to allow a person to uh, uh, stay within that RV for a period of 72 hours, as, as has been since the zoning code was uh, updated in 2013. Um, so, and we'll bring that later. But this is specifically right now for the um, 
general offenses section of the code for the police department. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? Okay, so this is the first reading, but let's go ahead and take a vote anyway. Uh, Judy, can you do the roll, please? Yes, Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hempling. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Hausch. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so then that brings yeah. us to <coughs> resolution 2018 hmm. And uh, I guess by title only, Judy? Yeah, and the title is the entire darn thing. Uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so this is a resolution accepting the amounts and rates as determined by the Budget Commission and authorizing the necessary tax levies and certifying them to the county auditor. Okay, can I get a motion, please? Move. Mm -hmm. Second. All right, Patty? This is the, uh, the resolution that we have to pass every year that simply certifies the rates. The auditor sends us the rates. We say okay. We pass a resolution. We send it back. It's a pro forma standard requirement. It's the rates of taxation that we already have in place. Correct. Okay. Um, so all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. So now is the time on the agenda when we accept comments from citizens that are about issues that are not on the agenda. Um, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes and uh, Judy keeps the time on that. Um, so do we have any citizen concerns? Chris? Hello. Uh, and this is, my understanding is we're not taking the home ink item in new business, correct? Uh, yeah, council decided that we will do that um, okay. at a, on a future agenda. All right, well then I wanna take this opportunity. I'll introduce myself, Chris Bongiorno. I'm the board president of Yellow Springs Home Inc. We have several other board members and our executive director, Emily Seibel, in the room. Um, and we want to first say thank you for the opportunity uh, to join you at this meeting. Uh, we submitted a letter a couple of weeks ago outlining a capital campaign request of the village in support of our 20th anniversary um, Glen Cottages Pocket Neighborhood Development. Um, <laughs> This project represents uh, the ambitious growth of our organization in line with our strategic plan and goals, um, which include broadening the breadth and depth of our programs and our uh, offerings, including uh, meeting the needs of uh, a larger variety of housing units and household types. Um, we are also pleased, and we covered this in the letter, that this aligns well with the village council goals that you've adopted this year um, that, that cover some of the same issues in, ter in terms of housing affordability and diversity and developing housing that meets all these diverse needs. Um, the Glen Cottages Pocket Neighborhood Development will provide up to 14 units of permanent uh, affordable housing in the village. Um, it will provide a mix of housing types and will de be developed over several phases in order to, to um, make the, the financing model sustainable. And that's how this request of the village um, comes into play. And we can detail it more when we're on uh, as a business item. Um, the capital campaign is looking to raise up to $350,000 or more uh, of a $2.7 million project. Um, we already have $200,000 in hand from a great collection of local supporters, and we're looking forward to an opportunity to partner with the village on this project. Um, and we can talk more about, we can ask questions obviously, but we can talk more about it uh, at a future meeting. I wanted to give an opportunity for anybody else to speak on this project. Thank you. Okay, thanks Chris. Uh, does council have any questions at this point? Oh, okay. She's awesome. Yes. Hi. Uh, good evening, uh, council members. I'm here to support uh, Home Inc.'s uh, request. So my name is Jacqueline Radeball. I live in Beaver Creek, and I'm a board member of Home Inc. Uh, I work in Dayton with um, individuals of low and moderate income that cannot always afford um, affordable housing. Um, cannot always have access to housing, and I also work with um, affordable housing providers uh, that are looking closely to what you're doing in Yellow Springs and how uh, Home Inc. and the village is addressing the affordability issue that you have. Um, I'm here to express my gratitude um, for your past and current support to affordable housing and specifically Home Inc.'s 
uh, work here. Uh, I'm new uh, to the area, uh, but I know that uh, this um, village support has been essential to uh, Home Inc.'s work in the past. Uh, in the past. Um, I want to uh, commend the village's work uh, in your housing uh, needs assessment. I believe that uh, Yellow Springs uh, housing demand uh, is expected to grow um, in the upcoming years at a, a higher rate than our surrounding areas, and I think that's what you found uh, in your housing needs assessment. And um, there's an important um, critical need for um, affordable housing and to address that issue. Um, so I want to ask not for uh, only your support, but also your investment. Um, investing in affordable housing under the Home Inc.'s um, Community Land Trust model is uh, uh, one of the best uh, ways of protecting public investment, uh, and it will ensure that those homes uh, remain affordable for Home Inc., um, for Yellow Springs uh, home buyers for generations to come. So uh, your investment in Eglin Cottages will, I believe, expand and preserve access to uh, home ownership for Yellow Springs households and uh, that are currently excluded from uh, the market. Um, our region is cost burdened. It's not only here, it's spreading a little bit uh, towards Dayton, and um, your support can definitely relieve uh, that cost. So I thank you for your support uh, to Home Inc., and, um, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, actually, I do have one question. Uh, so is there a, a timeline in terms of making a decision, Emily? Well, uh, we came to you now because we know you're starting to put the budget together. And so it's really, uh, we were really just thinking about what made the most sense for council. So we don't have a, a finite um, looming deadline. It was more out of just regard for your process. Okay. Awesome. Well, well, I do have a question. I think that your request was for a total of 60,000? Oh, it's spread over three years? Well, it would be your, your choice, but yes, up to, up to three years. Okay, so that might be a possibility. So I guess the more definite, I think, like did you want it in 2018 or starting in 2019? I would like to propose that we have it on next council's agenda, whatever that date is, the first meeting October, so it would be good to know your exact request sure our, our re exact request would be um, a funding commitment of 20,000 per year to match the community foundations investment in the project starting in 2018 2019 2020 um, and if the budget because th that that's a similar request that we've been making with other stakeholders and organizations if there if there is not uh, money in the 2018 budget then um, it would be up to council to determine if if it was 30,000 a year for two years, or I mean, it could conceivably be pushed out farther than that, but to keep on pace with the project timeline, it would be most beneficial in three chunks starting in 2018. Or, or two chunks in 2019 and 2020. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, I just wanna uh, say that, uh, first of all, Home Inc., um, as some people here know, but some people don't know probably, uh, is an organization that came into being through the work of a task force of the council. And that was several years ago. Um, 20, 20. 20. 20 years ago. It's our 20th anniversary ago. capital <laughs> campaign. <laughs> okay. So um, it's, not, uh, it's not just a nonprofit here in town that does great work. It is a brainchild of the council, of the village government, which I think is just important to remember there is that foundational relationship um, I guess the only thing I'm thinking about is, you know, we're, we're looking at, um, I mean, it's a great project. Uh, I think it's asking the village to help with affordable housing in some financial way makes sense. Um, we've got this, you know, big thing we're going to be looking at in the next uh, months around affordable housing and the needs for affordable housing in rel relationship to development of the glass farm. And some of the need, you know, this is affordable, home, uh, this is home ownership housing, it, correct? It, no, it's actually, I, I'm really glad that you brought that okay, up. Okay, because that's what I was 
Okay, go ahead. And explain. what we could do is, is submit some additional uh, details on the types of housing, but mm -hmm. um, what we're doing is we feel a prototype, we're testing out new housing types, including uh, fully accessible um, rentals for people of very low and low income and those with special needs. We're also testing three different kinds of home ownership projects to go all the way up to moderate income. Um, and we're trying to create a really diverse neighborhood that could be replicated. And all of the housing priorities that we're doing on this sort of prototype housing for are confirmed as, as really important needs in the housing needs assessment. Um, so this is, in a way, a, a testing ground for potential future collaborations. But they're home ownership, not rental, correct? Um, in this particular project? In this project, six of the units would be rental and the rest okay. would be home ownership. Okay. So it's a mix. I guess my only point is, so you're saying for the next three years, and I guess I'm kind of wondering if it makes, what's coming into my mind is this idea that, um, you know, should the village be, I'm just thinking there's going to be this other stuff happening also at the glass farm and you know some of that if we do this it may preclude us doing something you know that might be essential for really lower income rental that to me is the, the of highest need so I just that's the only thing I just sort of had this question in my mind will this preclude then us you know if we're committing 20,000 to this project per year for the next three years and there is this other pot potential need, I mean, I, I guess I just have this little question mark about how we're prioritizing it all. And, well, you know, and so I, I don't know. Part of our so I guess that'll be the, the part of meeting. the discussion. So that's something to, that I would like to think about. And I know you asked me if we could meet and I haven't had the time, but uh, it's just a, a question in my mind. Is how do we, you know. I think another thing, Patty, that we should pass on to Colleen to prepare for this discussion is just kind of understanding where, I mean, is this just coming out of the general fund or is there some other kind of fund? Um, well, I would see, um, I mean, you know, we have this fund, uh, Green Space Fund, and so one thing council might want to think about is creating a fund. And, uh, but again, you know, how to, so, that would kind of uh, be modeled on that yeah. mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, so that it would go into a fund. I'm not sure. Yeah, so there is not currently a line for this, um, where this money comes from. Um, there could be, as Judith should, suggested, a fund set up similar to the Green Space Fund. Keep in mind, the Green Space Fund money comes out of the general fund. Yeah, it does. This money would come out of the general fund. Um, council puts a certain amount of money aside for green space. If council chooses to put a certain amount of money aside on an annual basis, create a line, put this into that particular line, and say this amount of money is available this year, first come, first serve basis if you meet with whatever, set a process up, just like you have for various other incentive things. Well, with green space funding, it's all always gone to Tecumseh Land Trust. I don't think it's ever gone to anything, any other organization. So. But I appreciate, I mean, I feel like I really appreciate that you're coming forward. I hear you saying you're bringing this before the but, before, because budget conversations are coming. And yes, it's going to come out of the general fund and it's going to be a part of a commitment to affordable housing that we have set dated as a top priority. Mm -hmm. But. Um, you know, so I think, kind of thinking about how we structure it, it seems like there might be a larger conversation for well, the council. Well, you know, the, the Beatles, I think, that life's what's happening when you're making other plans. So uh, it's great. I, I so much appreciate that Home Inc. is moving forward on this, that faster than we are on our housing initiative process. I sure wouldn't want to stop Home Inc. because we haven't gotten to the point yet coming to council to start an affordable housing trust fund, but that will certainly be a recommendation that I will be making to council. So, you know, go for it. I don't see, uh, we've, we've supported green space for a number of years and it's time to start supporting affordable housing to the same or more degrees. Well, is it, and, and, and I will point out two things, um, that one possibility, just a general possibility, is that, Marianne, you pointed out that there are several things that council's talking about 
spending money on tonight and maybe council looks at the possibility of creating one budget line for these for all of these types of things like incentives for green space and incentives for housing and et cetera, et cetera. I mean part of a budget I'm sorry and, and while I'm supportive of home Inc's mission um, we do have to consider that we do give home Inc tap fees on a regular basis and it, I think it's important to note that 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 can also add up in what we're what we're providing I Lisa, mean did, I'm oh, sorry. sorry Lisa did you want to say something um, no, I'm not yet. I'm, okay. I'm list. Thank okay, you. Okay, Judith, go ahead. I mean, uh, one of the things, you know, there's this kind of progressive process called uh, uh, participatory, participatory budgeting. budgeting. Participatory budgeting. The budget is for our, pri you know, it's a thing about what are our priorities and then thinking about, so that money's just not sitting there for, you know, just to sit there. It's there to budget priorities so I don't know if that's what it makes me think about is you know as that's part of our budgeting process well, so and anyway. one thing we've learned related to that is that some municipalities will take a part of their budget and that you know is put into that through that mm -hmm. process so I'd be open to thinking about that mm -hmm. um, and and again I agree we've set a precedent with green space mm -hmm. uh, what's important to me though is I want to start <laughs> budgeting as, as specifically as we can. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important mm -hmm. moving forward that you know we're thinking exactly about where these general funds are going. Mm -hmm. So um, just like we've done with our capital improvement funds. Um, okay, uh, yes, I'll do Malta and then Dave. I just wondered if we were on citizen concerns or not. Uh, we are gonna move forward with, uh, yes. So I just have one thought and that is um, as we move forward with this affordable housing uh, focus. Um, it's interesting to think about um, a set of different test pilot kind of projects rather than one macro project. So the Antioch College pocket neighborhood is kind of one um, slice. Mm -hmm. The Home Inc. initiative, this pocket neighborhood, is another kind of an interesting dynamic uh, because it's also focusing on a community that's living within this context and you're bringing together uh, older folks, younger folks, families who are trying to find starter homes to bring kids into the community, rental, and so on and so forth. So that's the thing I think that's interesting about this. So rather than one big macro uh, effort, maybe some smaller cuts, slices of the pie, and we see what works best. Okay, but those are my thoughts. Thanks, Malta. Thank you. Um, Dave, did you have a? No, I just. Okay. Well, you know, and honestly, with citizen concerns, as you know, sometimes there's one topic that dominates the, the stage. So, um, and council did say we want to figure out how we're going to move forward with this discussion, which I think is helpful. Jackie, did you want to say something? Did I see your hand? Kind of. I'm okay. a little bit scared, though. But <laughs> I promise to smile. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, full disclosure, I too am a board member of Yellow Springs Home Inc. And for the, la uh, for the last five years, I think, home, uh, board member, but for the last one year, also a resident of the village. And I just would like to speak to your point, uh, Councilwoman your Jackie Anderson. And Councilwoman Hempling, I'd like to speak to your point about how we have a desire to maybe consider other projects on the horizon in terms of especially glass farm and a priority that might be in place around affordable rental units <coughs> and um, I would want to make sure that we mightn't forget that we have an expert developer partner um, possible here with in, 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 in our organization of Yellow Springs Home Inc. and um, to be able to have a testing ground, as Emily said, for the very priority that you see on the horizon for the council, if you feel like you can establish best practices and lessons learned for less than $60,000 that won't be a really great detriment to the community, I challenge you to do so. But I think you're going to be hard pressed to find anybody who has done what Yellow Springs Home Inc. has done as well as it has done it for as long as it has done it and served as many people as it has done. Um, anywhere remotely close to this community. That's why Emily, our executive director, is on the national stage, and that's why 
our organization is in the spotlight statewide and nationwide. So don't miss the opportunity to catch the coattails of the organization right here in your hometown and to um, uh, learn and establish best practices around our expertise, I would humbly say. <laughs> <laughs> I like that last statement. Thanks, guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, okay, are there any other citizen concerns? Uh, Mayor Kanine? Okay. Mayor Kanine, this isn't a concern as much as it is just an opportunity to formally thank Ann Portinga for her work in the first eight months of the changeover in what was a very lengthy mayoral term before I was fortunate enough to take over and Ann was fortunate enough to replace someone who'd been in the office for 30 years. So needless to say there was much updating to be done, new procedures, modernization if you will, uh, to take over from the folks who, who guided the ship for such a long time. We were very fortunate to have Ann and I would like her publicly recognized both in the video and in the written record so that she knows how much she did to get our new administration, if you will, off to a good start. I'm very sad that she's leaving. She's very sad that she's leaving. But she has another full-time job and with the increased um, responsibility uh, coming to the mayor's office, it, the job demands more time, which Anne did not have time to give. So she leaves in a very, uh, very sad way, and we will miss her. But I know Elise will do a great job. Mm -hmm. So thank you. All right. Thank thanks, you. Mayor Canine. Thanks, Pam. Yeah. I mean, thanks, Ann. Thank yeah. Sounds good. <clears throat> okay. Uh, anything else? All right. So we've got a couple special reports, and I believe uh, Kevin Stokes. You are going to tell us, uh, update us on the implicit bias training that was village wide. Yes. Thank you. So, in the way of introduction, um, first of all, I was just reading over the uh, Justice System Task Force report earlier, and I didn't know that that's something that JSCF talked about uh, last year. I guess March of, of last year. Um, so. Part of what I campaigned on was implicit bias and, you know, cultural competence and those kinds of things. Um, so Thursday, this past Thursday, I went to um, Pichacucha in Dayton. Uh, Pechacucha, Pichacucha, Pachacacha. PK. PK, thank you. Um, <laughs> so what it is, is uh, if you see it or read anything about it, it's called PK 2020 or Pecha 2020. It's 20 PowerPoint slides, 20 seconds per slide. And the reason that this format was created was for people like me who um, could go on and on and on about something to force us uh, to be more succinct in our presentation. Um, so. I have taken uh, the slides that our presenters uh, provided to us and whittled them down, made some modifications. I did uh, call uh, Tiffany Taylor Smith and say, hey, I'm doing this, <laughs> but I'm leaving all of her copyright stuff intact. Um, and no one's come to arrest me yet. Um, so. And again, I'm just trying to, because I only have 20 seconds per slide, I'm trying to say all of my introductory stuff ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, <it's not laughs> you're I'm, cheating. Uh, no, 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 the clock cheating. doesn't start. Cheating. <laughs> to, okay, perhaps that's cheating. <laughs> but yeah, the clock starts when Judy says, uh, well, when you guess when Judy starts the presentation. So I will do my best. Um, I did probably, I probably did probably try to put too much on some of the slides. You're down to 12. Come down, let us reason together. <laughs> I, sp I tend to speak in spurts. I'm, I think I'm quiet most of the time. I do my little bits here and there, and I try to not say things where things just don't need to be said. No disrespect to any of my colleagues. <laughs> but um, so, and since we've whittled back the agenda. I'm not intending to take up all of the time that we saved, but uh, this will be six minutes and 40 seconds. 
from the time I begin. So, Judy, whenever you're ready. So, there were two sessions of implicit bias training offered to village government over a two-week period. The first session was on Wednesday, August 8th. The second was August 15th. There were two sessions each day to allow uh, folks who uh, work different shifts to be able to come to any presentation they needed. The items on the first slide here talks about the agenda, and I'm behind already. So, um, so icebergs, we know about icebergs. You see just the tip of the iceberg, and typically when we talk about organizations, you just see what we say about ourselves, about how we get things done. But beneath the surface, there's a lot more going on. That happens both from an organizational perspective and from an individual perspective. So just keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. So when we talk about our cultural story, we look at these identity characteristics, and these are things that make up who we are. And so we were asked during the training to, to find five of these things that influenced who we are, and we tried to talk about one that provided us a, so a source of pride, a source of pain, and a source of privilege. Diversity and inclusion will quickly, diversity is the richness of human differences, and that's what makes human life uh, so interesting to be a part of. And But this is what every uh, human brings to every interaction that we're involved with. Inclusion is how we engage with those different uh, areas of diversity. Um, we develop our cultural confidence, first of all, co uh, competence rather, by first of all being uh, culturally aware, then we gain cultural knowledge, and then we exercise cultural skills, which are the tools we need to be able to engage uh, in different uh, areas of culture. See, I made up time already. Um, the cycle of oppression begins with stereotypes. There are stereotypes that are forced upon us. From those stereotypes, we develop prejudices. That leads to discrimination and ultimately oppression. What, what was not discussed in the training was another step where it's um, internalized oppression, where the people think of that uh, of themselves as opposed to what other people put on them. Uh, cultural dimensions, uh, we look at these five different things to talk about whether um, we have challenges in, in, this, in operating in these different areas, of the way that people describe themselves, you know, sexual orientation, age, and whatnot, and we can, some of us are more comfortable with others. So I get to pause here, but there's, you should go to this site or look it up, Unequal Opportunity Race. There was a lot of comment about this short video. It's an animated film that talks about effectively, to say for the sake of time, the vestiges of slavery. Um, it talks about how, uh, I will move on, <laughs> uh, there we go. So implicit bias, um, you know, there are studies that suggest that our attitudes, our stereotypes impact our understanding of other people and, and their actions and their, that therefore affects the decisions that we make and most of these decisions are unconscious. Microaggressions, one definition of microaggressions uh, states that they are subtle, uh, but uh, offensive comments or actions directed at a minority or other non-dominant group that is often unintentional, un unintentional or unconsciously reinforcing a stereotype. And again, it's really important to remember that a lot of these things are unconscious. So belief perseverance is sort of like being in an in a, a echo chamber. Uh, once you believe something, uh, it's hard for you to let go of that thing and you tend to just surround yourself with people that believe the same things and you listen to the same types of things and we see that in our politics and talk radio and cable news uh, channels. Uh, with respect to diversity discussions, the group was asked uh, these questions uh, of, of the group, what about Ye uh, the Yellow Springs Village? You know, what's our current climate about diversity? What are the current challenges? And where would we like to see ourselves in the future? And there was a wide range uh, of things that came from those discussion groups. Uh, categorizations and stereotyping. Uh, when you categorize folks, you put folks in a box. You decide based on folks' appearance and whatnot, this is what I think about those, those people. Um, and, and when you become, when it gets to stereotyping, you are applying those beliefs to a particular individual. Um, there are results from studies that demonstrate that people often hold implicit or unconscious assumptions that influence their judgments. And so this whole thing is how does our implicit bias or our implicit associations affect the decisions that we make and the things that we do on a daily basis. So um, 
So, Martha and Snoop's potluck dinner party. <laughs> it airs on VH1. Snoop Dogg, or Calvin Cordesar Brodus Jr. is an American rapper, blah, blah, blah. Martha Helen Stewart, American blah, blah, blah. One of these people has been in prison, one has not. <laughs> Um, in communications, 30 to 40 percent of what we communicate is verbal, therefore 60 to 70 percent of it is nonverbal. So we can say all the right things to people, but if we're not conscious of our bodies, what people get from that message is what they see, not what they hear. Um, effective cr uh, cross-cultural communicators respect other individuals from other cultures. You can see the list yourself. They're flexible about the things they see and hear. They have a sense of humor. So these are the things we want to take on our, of our, ourselves as being effective cultural cross-communicators, uh, commu cross-cultural communicators. Um, own your stuff. I mean, we've got to recognize that we are biased whether we think it or not. You are, everyone in this room is biased. So when you're dealing with folks from other cultures, own your stuff. Recognize your weak weaknesses. Be open to sharing. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable made up a few more seconds. Uh, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna read all those, but there were lots of, this is just a sampling of the feedback, starting from the top, things were a little hard, people, people had issues with the video uh, in particular, but at the end, folks loved it, um, and they thanked us for it, so it was a real good effort, very well attended, and, and uh, very highly participated in. As we move forward, uh, the presenters will come back and uh, work with leadership and support about doing the, uh, having discussions about the things we can do to make some of the changes that were affected during this two-week period, make some of those changes more long-lasting and more effective as we branch out into the community. And I'm done. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm telling you. See, I'm not going to say another word. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kevin. And, you know, I did want to say, you know, I think it's important that we find ways to continue uh, the conversations uh, that don't just involve the trainers being here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the things that we've got to continue to work on is, you know, carrying forward the lessons when we do these kind of village-wide training. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank right. you, Judy, for your help. Oh. <laughs> oh, all right. We got to put you on the on the road, <laughs> um, Pat Deweese, Justice System Task Force Biennial Report. Uh, Pat Deweese, and I've been on the task force for since its inception. Live to tell the tale. <laughs> I've titled this a final report because the task force is coming to its ending. Um, I guess I'll just point out a couple of things and then be open to questions. Um, one thing I want to remind everyone is that the task force was actually established in the spring of 2016. There's a general kind of story that it's the result of our New Year's Eve crises, but that's not true. It happened much earlier and the task force began its work in the fall of 2016. And it was motivated by this national conversation at the federal, state, and local level about things are not quite how we want them to be between the community and our police departments. Um, and that was a commitment on the part of the council at that time to really look at what kind of changes do we need to commit ourselves to? How do we change this culture? And that's a long-term commitment. Now, the New Year's Eve events, of course, escalated for all of us. I mean, it escalated time, pressure, and results. We've got to do something. We have to do it now. Um, so I think that a lot of what happened, and a lot happened, um, was really that sense of the crisis. Um, but that's not how it started, and that wasn't the intention of it. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, also, right after the, the um, New Year's Eve um, challenge to the village, we had enormous amount of citizen involvement in the task force. I mean, we've had, I, I was looking at some old files. I had a, a file of, I would say, 40 to 50 letters, emails, phone call records in January and February of citizens in the village who were like, what can I do? Can I be on one of the committees? I have this idea. You should do this. I mean, there was enormous uh, citizen involvement, and that has continued. 
we have really only one time had a meeting of the task force in which some citizens did not show up. And that was because we had changed the date because of reasons I don't remember. So we've continued to have a lot of active involvement. Um, the second thing, and I, and I think we want to have appreciation for that. We've had citizens who have stayed the entire two years working on some of our task force um, working groups. Um, there's really been an ongoing concern, and you can see that in letters to the paper, nothing else. So there's still this uh, strong interest, um, and we can appreciate that. Um, I also want to appreciate our police department, um, and that's starting back with Chief Hale in the fall of 2016, because Chief Hale at first, and then followed by uh, Brian, by um, Really, the whole department has been willing, not always in agreement, of course, but willing to talk, to be open to dialogue, to give information, to come up with ideas, to give feedback. So we've been very fortunate. I mean, that doesn't happen everywhere. And we've had, instead of resistance, we've had an opetus, like, let's talk about this. We have some issues. Let's talk about it. And um, don't want to uh, miss uh, appreciating the council, because this is a big job. This is a big thing, changing culture and looking at policy issues. And so I think the council's made that commitment early on, has continued to um, be willing to do that, and I think that's important. Uh, the chart is the seven or so recommendations that were accepted by the council, and then we all realized, and I'm sure people on the council realized, that um, then when it came to implementation, there were questions. How do we implement this? Who's going to implement it? How do we you know, carry it out. Um, Kevin mentioned the fact that we looked at implicit bias very early, and we had a one-day training, and it was a little bit of a hurry, but it got things started, but then how do you keep going with that? Mm -hmm. So we have, in each of these cases, um, some things that were immediately implemented and have been, you know, very much integrated into the department. Others that are still, you know, an ongoing sort of discussion about how do we actually do this? What are the guidelines for the mayor's court if we pass this, this particular ordinance? Um, and then also in the report we have um, just a, a summary of the 2018, that is this year's goals and um, activities of the working groups. So we're still trying to finish up some of these things that got started in 2018. So let me just stop and ask if there are questions about any of these things. I think we've done an enormous amount, yes. and, and I think mm -hmm. the council has been willing to listen to and consider an enormous amount of change, and the police department has been burdened with ha being forced to think about and consider an enormous amount of change. So generally, I think we have a lot to be proud of, and, and I don't think it's like a, even though the task force is coming to an end, I think the work really must continue. I don't think we've come to an end of the, of the work. But. I have a question. Sure. First of all, thank you and thank the committee, everyone that's been involved in this. Given the amount of work that's been done, how is it being documented so that it can continue to be used? Is, well, I think a number of the, the committee members have boxes full of papers and files and, you know, um, we have minutes of our meeting. I'm not sure what documentation, what are the, we have the, those recommendations are in the the uh, minutes of the council. Um, do you want to give an example of something you have a question No, about? I'm just thinking that, um, as you probably know, there's a proposal to continue in some form a commission, right. and clearly we want to continue this work. So it seems like having uh, the documentation of what were done, the minutes of the meeting, the you know everything that's happened, having it well put together so it can be passed off and accessible. Right. Well, I'm not sure about the well put together, but we have huge, huge files. I know many of us do, and uh, I also I, I I really sorry that I didn't mention our leadership of Judith. I'm still kind of reeling from your announcement yeah. about changes, but I want to be sure to say that she certainly was the person with the insight and the articulation of the concern early on, and she's continued to be uh, important in her leadership. Of Thanks. Well, I do want to say, I mean, I think one thing to, you know, Mary Ann's point, um, I mean, I think we've kind of come to the conclusion that there will be certain works in progress that, you know, will need to continue um, later. 
Uh, and so making sure that we've got, you know, any of that work that's, you know, been done. And, you know, as we've said before, I don't think anyone's going anywhere. So, you know, so we've got uh, the task force as a resource. So. Right. In terms of the do a lot of the documentation, I mean, these big packets that we <laughs> had for every meeting, uh, uh, Judy has put on or who, somebody's put on the website. I mean, they haven't, hopefully they won't be deleted. So there, you know, all that. There is a lot of documentation. A lot. Don't tell and the tree committee how much there is. I mean, yeah, it's a <laughs> lot. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, but yeah, and I want to. Uh, I mean, Pat has been uh, one of the strong leaders of the committee. I mean, really, everybody's taken a lot of responsibility. Everyone. Pat has and is citizens. Pat's very good at writing it up what we do, and Thank I really appreciate much. that because it's sort everyone's of captures. Everyone's done an enormous amount of yeah. work. No, it's true. Yeah. And Lisa has been a great, uh, and Lisa's been a great asset to, to our <laughs> task force as well. Giving us good feedback. Any other questions? And, and I just wanted to acknowledge Kate, who's sitting back in the corner. Much so. Who, yes. I think it was Kate who was the person who first, at least as far as I'm aware of, talked about the police social worker and started investigating that. And there she is, right mm -hmm. in front of us. <laughs> she had, she, I know she had some support from Bill for our, I mean, Again, we had citizens who worked on all of these issues, sure. every single one of them. And so. we have Dave Turner here, who's been very involved in the mayor's yeah. court uh, issues. Um, well, I definitely appreciate the perseverance, because um, I know it's been hard work as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I know there was some. Chief Edis. Oh, Chief. Just want to take this moment. I asked Florence to join us tonight. Um, Maybe we need you at the mic. Brief, but I wanted to thank Justice System Task Force, Councilperson Hempfling, Dave, Lisa, Councilperson Creek, Kate, Florence is our record. Um, we are at the point, literally now, with people at the dispatch window, we're asking them to get in line. This, this is for real. And I, I can't say enough how having Florence as part of the police department has changed our working methods enough. As a peace officer in critical incidents, we do the best we can to aid the victims, those in need, but we're back at what we do. And many times victims are just waiting. Florence arrives now on scene and we are in and angels' hands. So thank you, Kate, Justice Task Force, System Task Force, and Florence for uh, the addition that we've had on the police department. And Patty, your support. And council's okay. support in establishing the position. Yeah. Absolutely, and, I, and Patty, I did mean to say, uh, the knowledge that Patty has uh, given me as I learn, as I go, um, I can't thank you enough. You're very welcome. Right. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to echo too that we heard, uh, you know, about the a recent critical incident. This, the, a lot of the staff was involved in helping. Mm -hmm. That where Florence was uh, present, and what a big difference it made that mm -hmm. she was there. Mm -hmm. so, yes, very thank much you. so. Good. Um, I know there was some mention about whether Pat, you wanted to make any highlights about your um, other reports. Well. I understood them to be background for things that were coming forward. Okay. I mean, I wonder if maybe if you were able to come for the next meeting, if it would make sense to put back on the agenda. I don't know if you want to or if you want to do it while you're here. <laughs> but that other report. It's not expanded yet. Already on the agenda. Dave just pointed out that I'm giving the same report. It's the. What? It's on that future. It was must be an error, huh? <laughs> anyway, I don't know how we. Oh, it is. You're right. You're on there for October first. Yeah, we moved. You're so good. We moved you up. So, all right. Because this is good background for what we're going to talk about next. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we're ready. Right, so, how do we want to just kind of hold the idea of whether we want to get an actual presentation on that? Do we want, in I, terms of those different uh, kind of body? 
It's it quite rolling. <laughs> it is quite rolling. So do you want to do it now? That's what I'm saying. Should we hear from Pat now to give I, a little bit? Of, I think Pat's okay. saying that she doesn't have anything to highlight now. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know. Is that what I heard you say? That you'll, you'll be here to answer questions as we get into the discussion? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. That sounds fine. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Yes. Next week, uh, CIT training will be at Antioch, and um, Florence will be presenting the suicide prevention portion of that to officers in Greene County. We're real excited about that. Council is invited to come and sit in any of the sessions that you would like, and I can give you information. Just yeah, please send that Thank to you. us. Um, cool. Uh, okay. okay, so I think we're ready to move into old business. And uh, the first thing that is on the agenda for old business is the um, Justice System Commission proposal. And Judith, okay. I'll let you lead All off right. with that. All right, I'm gonna set my thing here. Okay, so uh, you'll, there were two documents in the uh, packet about this. One is language, of, that's an actual ordinance la uh, language about a Justice System Commission, and the other is this introduction. And I'm sure Brian, will, uh, Brian and I worked on this together. Uh, so this is a recommendation that we develop, that we create a justice system commission. Um, let's see. Um, you know, the council has a uh, has a goal uh, about having a uh, model justice system here in Yellow Springs. And it's Brian and my feeling that it, that if we're actually, if that is really truly a goal of our community, we are going to need a commission to help with that work. Uh, I th I want to just say to yes, the task force has much to be proud of. Uh, there were some. It's been difficult. There's been it's been stressful. I think that there's been you know some difficulties uh, in our work, um, but as Brian wrote here. Uh, it's to be expected given the sensitive, sensitive and emotional nature of the work. And essentially, it is true that this is uncharted territory, what we're trying to do. Uh, I mean, there's others out there, but we're out in the front, I think, of the work around uh, our justice system in attempting to change attitudes and behaviors that are often perpetuated by training programs, traditional, outdated militaristic models, and it requires a long-term commitment of our community if we really want to see this change happen. It's going to take time. Uh, there's some things that we've learned, uh, you know, things that, that we've struggled with and learned from those struggles. Um, oh, and I want to just say, Justice System Task Force, I had decided the way we'd go forward with this proposal is that um, myself and then Brian joined me in developing this commission proposal, that it would not come from the task force itself. Uh, but at the last meeting, we did not have a vote, but we've been taking input. And uh, a, a, a strong majority of the task force membership um, expressed their belief that we need to go forward with a commission. Um, it also was uh, made, the point was made that Village Council needs to maintain a strong commitment to, the, to this goal in order for us to be successful. Uh, discussing, uh, let's see. Discussing the justice system in Yellow Springs has brought up painful awareness and, dis and the distrust that many feel around historic and current injustices and the, and the belief by many of us that the system needs reform. At the same time, uh, the village justice system is comprised of people with good intentions seeking to provide just service to our communities as peace officers, dispatchers, and our elected mayor. Um, um, as has occurred with the medical profession, which I'm a part of and have been a part of for over 40 years, uh, people demanded that we change our culture. And if you remember, if you're older, sort of some of the attitudes that particularly doctors would have uh, towards their patients, um, those, the culture has changed. It has really changed in terms of respect for the person that you're serving um, and just you just, you know, uh, um, hearing what uh, the patients, the, the approaches that, you know, when they need medical care that is, that is uh, supportive and helpful. And 
so that those services came into more alignment with the values of the patients who people were serving. And so that's the way I look at the changes that need to happen in our justice system. <clears throat> it's not about the goodness of the people in the system. It's about looking at the structures and the, where's, the places they, where things are not going well and the kind of change that needs to occur. Uh, several, uh, so one of the things that we um, are recommending, Brian and all, I, or that we think that council should consider, at, though we haven't had a chance to talk to the chief and the mayor about it, is this idea of an ex officio member. We have not had the best communication. We need better, more consistent communication with the two branches of our justice system in order as we're to, trying to think about policy. And so we want to think about how to do that. Uh, we want to, that was one suggestion. Uh, but we do want to talk with you guys. If, as someone pointed out to me, if they don't want to be there and they feel kind of, you know, and there's kind of a resentment about having to come to meetings that don't, they don't feel like their, their time is very useful there. You know, so we had to think about how to make it work. Uh, but that communication piece and having better communication. Um, but I'll say at the same time, yeah. it's been suggested that if, you know, the key people are at the table, things would move forward mm -hmm. more efficiently. Yeah, so just thinking about how to make that ha happen. Uh, we had several recommendations that had not included clear measurable actions in conjunction with the policies adopted and who was responsible for the next steps and how to ensure accountability and transparency regarding the effectiveness of the new policy. Um, <clears throat> so we wanted to think about, you know, the importance of developing those measurable uh, uh, actions, how we articulate that, and then that there would be regular uh, reporting on that to council. And then the task force, um, let's see, we also, you know, the document, I mean, Mary Ann and I actually developed it, creating the task force, we, we gave the task force a lot of work, <laughs> the council gave the task force a huge amount of work, and, um, you know, part of the little chaotic things that sometimes were happening was just the, there was a lot of work and we were trying to figure out how to manage that. And the fact that here at the end, council's getting a, you know, a lot of proposals coming um, is, is part of the, that's part of the reason for it. So thinking about uh, realistic goals for the work of the Justice System Commission, which I see as being established during Village Council's yearly goals setting process in discourse with the community and commission members as well as well as village team members. Um, the, ta the commission, it's not an NGO, it's not an independent group, um, you know, so that just keeping, you know, keeping that all in mind. Um, two sizable and important initiatives that task force was unable to even hardly be, really begin was ameliorating disparate impact of the justice system on the poor and alternative municipal policing approaches to drug control. Um, there's also citizen interest, significant citizen interest in reviewing our police complaint process and a civilian review board. Actually, um, Lisa's bringing a proposal tonight relevant to that interest. And um, then we also, Brian and I thought, we need to take time this new commission would, should take time to look back regarding the policy changes that have been made. If there haven't been measurable, goal, measurable actions connected to it, what should they be um, as kind of the first steps as it begins to, to work. And um, the, I just was going to read out the establishment and purpose, uh, which is in the ordinance, and then I'll stop. Um, let's see. And it's based on the HRC Commission uh, kind of framework. Uh, uh, there is hereby established in and for the village, the village a commission which shall be known as the Justice System Com Commission. Nationally, there is an understanding that the criminal justice system as an institution has need for reform. Unequal treatment by the justice system because of race, class, and mental illness has been identified as significant problems which need to be fixed as well as an incarceration incarceration rate which far outpaces every other country in the world. The Justice System Commission's purpose is to assist Village Council and the Mayor in supporting a village justice system that provides respectful service in the interest of justice for victims, respects civil liberties as proactively anti-racist, and fights the criminalization of poverty and mental illness. 
The Justice System Commission will be charged with making recommendations for policies and priorities the, that align the practices of the Yellow Springs Police Department and the Mayor's Court with community values of sustaining a just, safe, and welcoming community uh, across race, age, economic status, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, ability, and religion. Village Council and the Mayor will be responsible to establish measurable actions in conjunctions with the policies <coughs> adopted and will receive quarterly reports to ensure accountability and transparency. Okay, I'll just emphasize a couple things. Um, one of them being that I agree and I think all of council does, but it's a decision we have to make that um, our commitment to a model justice system is something that, uh, that we feel strongly about. So then that to me means that we need capacity to continue that work. Um, so, you know, ultimately if we do not establish a commission um, or something similar, then that work falls on staff and council. Um, so I, that's one thing I want to emphasize. The second thing is that uh, in putting together this proposal, I think it's really important to take out of this some of the uh, lessons we've learned that apply to all of our commissions in um, uh, truly adding capacity. And so earlier when we had the discussion about, you know, we have so many commissions, I think the point is we need to make sure that the commissions that we do have are furthering the village goals. And that's why it makes sense for council to put in that work and staff as well um, to accomplish those. But that's all based on our priorities. Um, and then the last thing I do want to emphasize is I don't want to conflate at least what I understand the definition of a citizen review board within this uh, recommendation. Um, I think this idea of a complaint review process is separate. Mm -hmm. This commission may provide capacity to, um, you know, further the work that Pat DeWeese did to figure out what the model should be, but I'm not thinking that this commission is also going to be a review board. All right, this commission is designed to support the policy work that council is um, committed to. Okay, so. Um, Council questions or comments? I guess my first question would, uh, would have maybe been uh, to Pat, but it's, you know, re relative to, you know, what, what Judith has, uh, has proposed. Um, you know, with respect to the ongoing things or the undone things, um, uh, you know, for for example, rec recommendations. You know about uh, to mayor's court. I mean, um, I mean, is that something that really requires, you know, that a task force or commission be done, or or now that a solid recommendation has been made, you know, can the parties responsible just take that and, and, and do it? Um, it? It's it's my understanding that whatever the body is, the body's goal was to make a re recommendation, uh, not to uh, monitor and facilitate the follow through uh, on, on that recommendation. And so that's just an example. I mean, there may be others, other recommendations that in and of themselves will take on a life of their own. Here's a recommendation. That means these three people need to do something. And if those three people are willing to do it, uh, it, by definition, then then it's a done deal. Um, you know, so so the work of that body is done. We've made the recommendation. It's been taken on. Uh, step away. You're done. So um, I think if we f first of all uh, approach all of this with that filter, you know, we will be able to make a uh, a better assessment of what the real need is. Um, on the other hand, I think we need to be careful with respect to the scope of whatever we try to take on. Um, I didn't say earlier, but I am also sensitive to, you know, the addition of um, anything that makes us broader and hinders our ability to go deeper into the work that we're already doing. And in this case, the creation of another commission. 
Um, so again, I just want us to uh, approach it from a from a, a, a hard analysis perspective and really look at the, the undone work and make sure we are um, or decide, you know, whether that work can continue without us going too far um, in terms of, of a commission. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I think I, I want to see um, the answers to those questions on each of the undone things uh, before I can make a decision. Okay. Um, Harriet? Well, I'm not unopposed to creating this commission. What I would like to see is something like spending the rest of this calendar year. Wait, what does that mean? I'm not unopposed. It's in the permit. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not no, saying I, I support it, but I'm saying I don't. Not. I'm, I'm not saying no to it. Okay. I'm not really saying yes. Let's go for it. But I'm not saying no. What I am saying is I'd like to spend the rest of this calendar year just reflecting on what was done, what worked, what, what didn't work, and with people who were on the task force, with the community, and at the council table. What are the lessons learned? Because I think there's a lot of grist for the mill. And there's still the ordinance regarding the mayor's task force, the surveillance. Those are the two that are still going to be coming, I think. Um, so my, my suggestion would be that at the beginning of next year or even starting the council off the get-go establish the goals and then look at all the commissions do do the commissions further our goals and, and hold commissions accountable because if a commission isn't doing anything or if they're not furthering our goals then maybe it's time to lay that commission down for a while and then choose what 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 is important to further our goals. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just step in and piggyback off something you, you, you just said, Marianne, in terms of you know the calendar. You've, and I've said before about us not allowing the calendar to force us into making a decision. Um, so I would s submit, yeah, just uh, allow things to take their natural course. Um, I think it's uh, stinking thinking uh, to submit that uh, there's some negative thing that's going to happen if there's a gap, you know, if 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 the justice system task force ends, and you know, 20 seconds later there's not a justice task force and there's this gap here. I don't I don't know that that necessarily suggests that you know the world's going to end. So uh, I think again there can be some time if. You know, as the commission wraps up its work, as the task force wraps up its, its work, and those uh, that have been that have been tasked, you know, by those suggestions, I think as that sort of takes its natural course, that there it's not bad, you know, to, to let some time go by before we are forced to make a decision um, for the next step. I'm just going to say this is a deliberative body. I intend to bring this recommendation to council. You are going to be asked to vote on this. So, you know, if you're not ready, if you're ready to vote, if you're not ready to vote for it and you're going to vote for, no, that's okay. I mean, that's your prerogative. I'll make the argument for it. But I, I'm, you know, I, I'm going to be coming off council soon. This is something I, we had said we would make some decision this year. That was a, dis, you know, I mean, if I have to stay past November in order to, you know, come to a final, that's, you know, but this isn't about, um, I really, I really think it's important that we not leave a lag. I think that's very important. And um, so, you know, I just want to say I'm going to bring it and I hope Ryan will be a co-sponsor of, you know, a piece of legislation and then council can decide, you know, whether they're ready to make that decision or not. Uh, and I, I mean, I think the task force members would be good if they, I thought more people would be here tonight, but, you know, can make the case for it. I, it's not, you know, if this is left lay for a while, I, I just think it's, I think it will be detrimental. But, you know, part of the thing is, you know, some of what you guys are saying we need to do, I would see this commission as actually 
you know, like I said, that look back um, and, you know, would, would be doing part of that because some of the decisions that we've made, we haven't had the measurable, we, we didn't put the measurements in place in a very effective way and um, so there's, there is work still to be done. There are, there are proposals that the task force is still going to be bringing probably, no doubt, going into next year because the work is almost done on those proposals and it's, it's the mayor's court, there's three proposals. Um, survey the surveillance. Is there any other ones that are still hanging out there? So it's those. They will be coming. Council needs to put them on the agenda when they, you know, when we have time to discuss them and give it the time it deserves. But um, the look back and all that. I mean, if there if there's a, a gap, I think, um, and this sort of, you know, trying to then start to pick up goals for next year that council's going to be developing early <coughs> next year. Well, who's going to do it? I mean, council can do it. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, and Lisa, before you I'm speak, sorry. I just wanted to say something related to that. Um, I definitely support the idea that um, council, if, if we decide to appoint a commission, is, is fairly directive in this first year about what's done related to the look back, how do we measure success, that sort of thing, um, as opposed to getting a lot of new things. Um, so anyway, so I, I think that's important to think about. Lisa? Yeah, um, I want to join others in, in recognizing the amount of work that's been done by the Justice System Task Force, both the people who serve on the task force as well as citizens who've been on subcommittees. I've been attending Justice System Task Force now for a little bit over a year started attending before I was elected and um, it, it's been an impressive amount of work. Uh, Judith, you've heard me say this before and maybe it's why you move forward with Brian rather than me mm -hmm. on this proposal. But I've, I've been saying for a number of months that in order for me to understand what this commission would look like, not to say it shouldn't exist, but to understand what it should look like and an, an analysis of lessons learned is critical to the design. There are some elements in this proposal that I know that there's citizen, both, both the task force members and likely citizen comments, particularly about the role of um, peace officers as ex officio or not. I mean, I think that there's just design elements in this proposal that, uh, that looking at what has worked, what didn't work, when the task force was successful at implementing change, why was it successful? When there were barriers or delays, why did those happen? And using those to inform the design of the new commission and the structure of the new commission, you know, this is something that I have felt has been very important and I, I'm really sorry that it doesn't already exist is I think it would help us to make a decision about, about this proposal. I don't know how quickly it could be done so that there isn't a gap. But for me to understand how a new commission would actually look and how collaboration would happen, how others would be involved, I do think that analysis is important. I guess I would echo, I think I would like to see that happen at council not happen in the commission out of the public eye. That, and that, so I don't really see a gap. Maybe there's a gap in terms of not having a formal body when the task force ends, whenever that is, although it seems to me those recommendations are gonna be coming through to the end of the year, so I'm not clear what the gap is. But I think it's important for these discussions to happen at council because that's, that's, to the degree that people know what's happening, that's where they know about it, not at the task force meetings. I, I, think, the, I think the case study of the, the mayor's court is a perfect example. This is a situation where all of, my perspective is all of the stakeholders agree, and yet it keeps getting put off month over month over month because of collaboration practices or the lack thereof. How can we learn from that to not repeat that in the future? It's a great case study. We're still playing it out even tonight 
by slowing down, you know. So um, I just think I think it would be great to talk about it openly and with with all the stakeholders engaged in the discussion. But again, I, I want to echo what other council people have said. I'm not saying that this isn't important work. I'm not saying it's not an important commission. I'm passionately dedicated to it, but I think we have the opportunity to learn and move forward to not repeat mistakes. And I mean, I think we're setting, I think we're, we have the capacity to really get it right here in Yellow Springs. We really do. It seems like everyone's really all in. So I think some analysis is important. Well, who's doing it? Well, I think what, what Marianne said is, is that it's a discussion in council and the justice system task force still exists. Okay, so we're gonna have a discussion next time. I mean, I don't quite know I, how to I, I imagine that, that this will be on the agenda for the next council meetings through the rest a of this couple. year and beyond. Yeah. It's in some form or another. Can I say something? Yes, yes, please, yes. Pat. Um, I guess I wanna say two things. One is um, we have to recognize, I'm sure people do recognize, but it's important to make it really uh, visible the recommendations came out of the task force. The implementation comes through the council and village manager's office and the police department. So this is interactive. So there's two layers that need to be looked at. One is, you know, what were challenges we had as a task force and what who should be on a ta you know, a commission. So there's those issues, but I think the that the the other layer is really a conversation yeah. here. You know, and it probably needs to be facilitated. I mean, you've had the experience of it, but I don't know that those of us on the task force can contribute a lot to why didn't this go forward or why did it, people said, yes, we, we accept that recommendation and then nothing happened, why? I don't think we can answer that. I think that the council has to think through how will we respond? What is our, what is our role or our decision process in carrying out these recommendations. But the other thing I wanna say in terms of why I believe we should not have a gap, it's the same reason we started the task force in the spring of 2016. We're currently, in case no one's noticed, we're in a backlash about this conversation we had about reforming the culture. Um, our Attorney General, Mr. Sessions, has just reopened free military equipment to any police department that wants it, and so far Ohio has taken the most, most military equipment. A lot of it's gone to the, to the parks and uh, Division of Natural Resources. I don't know why, but they're with the ones with the M16s and you know the armor and everything. So this idea that, that um, going back to all of the, in my view, um, mistaken assumptions about the war on drugs and how we can solve that, are being lifted up and pushed out there again. And I think that it's necessary for the village to say, you know, we're gonna stay on our track, which is we're going to have, you know, between the, our community and our police department, we're gonna have a good relationship, we're gonna have collaboration, we're gonna have shared understandings of what we want. And I don't think, I think it is a risk to have a gap. I was gonna say, it sends a message. People will understand a certain message if we decide to do that. Uh, if council decides to do that, maybe I won't make it, be making that decision. But um, uh, and it's going to be a it's going to be a message to citizens. It's going to be a message to our police department, and we certainly have been hearing from some people a discomfort with citizen oversight, with civilian oversight, I should say, of uh, policing. That is a dis there's a fairly strong discomfort, and you know. Uh, so, I think it will send a message, and I don't think it's a message we want to send, by the way. Um, Kate? I'm Kate Hamilton, <laughs> the Justice and Task Force. Um, trying to piggyback a little bit on what Pat had said. We, so I think we're doing a great job going forward as a more progressive, justice system. I think that is a goal. We're trying to lead the way in that. Unfortunately, we are not we, the nation is going backwards. I think 
Uh, someone had said something about 1099 coming back. That's um, military equipment that is given to police departments to basically militarize them. So I do think that in it's almost like we're we're trying to push forward, but also hold back this dam. And I think it is important to have continuity and to keep going with what we're doing right now. Also, because other things come up, other new ideas come up as as the commission will be, you know, rolling along, completing its other tasks. I mean, I brought the social work idea, and that really wasn't, um, that's not a mainstream thing, you know. So there are going to be other things that people within the commission, within our community, are going to learn about, about a more progressive justice force that they can bring and that we can work on. So I think it's really important to understand that and to also understand that we're not always necessarily, I'm not trying to get rid of you, but we're not always going to have this chief. We're not always going to have these sergeants and this force and this council. And so this establishes um, a commitment to this. This, you know, I've, I've been working on some of these things when there wasn't a commitment, when I was told in council meetings many times over that we will not do anything with the police department, nothing to do with them. And honestly, they work for you, you know? And so working together is, is just great. I mean, it's great to have that established and to show that there's that commitment. And I, I mean, I could tell you the falls, the things that didn't work, the things that worked. And, you know, one thing that did work was the subgroups individually working with the chief, for example. That was really effective versus um, having someone at our meetings. So I think that asks a lot, especially of the chief for us to come to all these meetings, but bringing different ideas to a small, like to one of the sergeants and the chief, that worked really well. So I, I don't have an answer for an ex officio or not, but I think it's, it's really important. I've heard a lot of citizens say they would like it to stay. They would like it to, I should say, stay, become a commission. Okay. Thanks, Kate. That's my case. Um, I do want to say ex officio, just a second does not mean someone's required to attend. It means they are welcome to attend. And that was an issue that um, was brought up before, that there was some separation there. Um, Dave? Well, I think that you know what you and you and you have said in all are very important things to consider for a variety of reasons. Um, I think it's important, however, to have some kind of end game in mind, not an ever, not an ever ending watchdog or a never ending watchdog and a citizens review board and whatever other things are going on. Um, you got to figure out what you want, like what you were saying about some other things and then try and focus on fixing some of those problems. Uh, and if they're important, prioritize them, not fix everything all at the time, all at the same time. If people in this town like to talk about talking about talking about things and then go away and think, gosh, we had a great meeting. Uh, but at some point, you have to do some things and you have to figure out what you want to do and how are you going to do it and then do it. And that's an important thing to build into the, into the task forces, um, into the commission if you create one. Uh, I think that what we've been talking about from the task forces perspective for the most part have been modifications and tweaks of policies, new policies, things like that. Those are valuable and important, but they haven't, I don't think they're completely, or in some cases at all, working towards repairing bridges and rebuilding lost trust, which exists in the town between the police and the not police. Uh, and need some more purposeful and focused interactions between the police department and residents and other things, I think, to address some of those issues. Because if people are upset about things that have happened, then it doesn't matter if you've got a new policy for you know, not using tasers on them. It's still going to have the feelings that they have. Not all of those things can be fixed, but I think that's an important thing that needs to be part of whatever you know, happens in the future. Um, and the people t frequently talk about how, oh, if only the officers lived in town like they used to. Just living in town doesn't immediately give you, you know, the right attitude that we all want. But you know, training and feedback and guidance on behavior and techniques do. Those people who don't take the guidance, they don't have to live here and work here, or, or, and they don't have to be kept on either. Uh, so I think we need to not keep talking about how great it would be if something impossible would happen. Um, and 
looking back in time at what happened is a good idea. I don't think you really want to do a lot of it as publicly as you might think, but you know, looking at some things would be valuable. Uh, so those are my thoughts on that. All right, thanks, Dave. Any other comments? Okay. This is the time. This was a uh, on on topic. Uh, Judy said this was time for me to present this. It sort of picks up from a, a previous. You have meeting. to come up. Okay, come up to the mic then. Um, Um, obvious. First of all, the task force is awesome, um, and a lot of great work has been done. I, I so appreciate it. I've, I've been following it, um, and I'm, I'm aware that uh, I want to say to start out that my sour stomach, my my chronic sour stomach with with the council uh, has just to do with policing. Everything else you're doing is awesome. I'm, I'm you're making us proud of here. It's great, but. Policing is a deal breaker, and uh, these are my views, um, and shared by some other people. Uh, these are my feelings, and I, I just wanted to finish this conversation that I had started back in July. Um, a meeting of the village council in July. I think I can do this in about three minutes. Um, at a meeting of village council in July, I made remarks regarding the police police policy and cast doubt on village government's use of power regarding police department. Um, I described the administration as corrupt and was later called out by the council person to present evidence of corruption. I wish to respond to that challenge and to uh, continue, if not complete, that conversation. The kind of corruption for which we have irrefutable and plentiful evidence is not the Rod Blagojevich sort, where politicians break laws for personal gain, as did the Illinois governor uh, in selling Obama's vacated Senate seat. What is painfully evident, however, is that after many hours of citizen testimony before council and other bodies, uh, following two major crises events in town, one in which a resident died at the hands of police, and another which made national press, the condition of the local police policy and practice remains nearly un indistinguishable from national norms. Numerous in-person uh, public appeals for, uh, to council for change persist. The simple and unacceptable fact is that many people in our town still do not and cannot trust the police to do their jobs. If council believes that popular discontent can be dismissed as a consequence of hearsay and unpleasantness on social media, I implore you to look again and closer. The present clash and contest of police cultures presently playing out in the department and on the desk of our solicitor should be telling us a story. Many of us are lost to explain why the council would read the story as it has and continue to stand behind the department, changed in tone, but not in tactics or character by the replacement of its chief. Now, 15 months ago, I want to say I stood here asking for a uh, two-year contract. That's, that was 15 months ago. Um, plans being drafted by the Social Justice Task Force are promising, some of them in, indispensable, in fact, if the rhythmic, rhythmic tide of excessive use uh, of force incidents, unprofessional behavior, and ineffective uh, investigations is to be turned. Plans for a, a new and upgraded mayor's court, a village prosecutor aid, regulation of police surveillance practices, uh, and our new position for a social work professional are also promising. As important and uh, appropriate as these measures are, uh, the, uh, as these measures suggest, suggested by the task force are, I see no intention to bring the degree of tr uh, independent oversight and transparency to the, the department necessary for a real effective change. That includes the proposed social justice uh, commission uh, per the draft legislation in your packet tonight. After the New, Year, uh, New Year's Eve incident, a very notable citizen told the council uh, that uh, the Yellow Springs should be able to kill the game, unquote. 
That is, establish a public safety department capable of enforcing ideals of social justice identified with the town. Unless and until the village can put in place a robust and thoroughly independent body with broad authority to monitor and report on police activity and to do so in real time, not after the fact, when the investigations are done, um, our citizens, uh, the, the citizens of our town will need to brace themselves for best practices, in incremental change, AKA no change at all from unacceptable prevailing trends. So that's to pick up my conversation, my claim and charge. So this is your evidence of corruption, this letter? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, different kind of corruption perhaps, but right. nonetheless. All right, thanks, Ken. Um, all right, so I think we need to wrap up um, this first discussion. And I do want to, in my mind, you know, I also thought that this would not be, you know, a, a one meeting discussion, but that it would carry across two or three meetings. Um, I think this was a good discussion. Um, I am thinking about, based on the feedback, um, some things that we can do to structure the next discussion, Judith so you and I can talk about that um, to try to respond to uh, some of the concerns and, and that sort of thing. So, um, but anyway, I think this was a good first discussion and, uh, and uh, we will revisit it soon. Okay, um, I can make the next topic really quick. Um, I reflected on what I heard from the last council meeting and also reviewed uh, actually the, the video to make sure I heard everything and came up with some ideas about how we might allocate the tasks around the village manager search. Um, so the only thing I tweaked besides adding names to the different categories based on what I heard was um, adding some clarity around the communications piece and that there's um, I guess a, an external part in terms of communicating the position and trying to find great candidates. And there's also a community piece, which is thinking about how we are going to keep our citizens informed and involved. Um, so beyond that, I don't know if anyone has any questions or if I misheard interests. Um, I guess one issue is uh, with Judith, uh, leaving, um, how that might impact some of these. But uh, at this point, what we at least know is that our first commitment is to getting that um, consultant RFQ done for the next meeting. Um, so I don't know that we have to get in depth about the other pieces yet, um, but this was. We have Kevin and I and Patty have met. And yeah, oh yeah, because that's happening in parallel. Right, mm -hmm. good. Um, so any discussion at this point? Looks good to me. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I just set my agenda aside. What's next? We've got uh, Lisa. Yeah, I proposed. can also yes. keep this brief. Um, at the last uh, meeting, I shared a purpose and membership section um, related to the Yellow Springs Community Development Corporation. Um, I want to clarify that this is a DCIC even though it has the words Community Development Corporation in title. It's a really, it's, it's confusing to me why the way the regulating language is written is that when you look at the language for a DCIC, it refers to it as a development corporation when, a, when there's a, a CDC as well. So we are proposing a DCIC called a Community Development Corporation. I know it's confusing. <laughs> um, but I've spent a lot of time reading that chapter, <laughs> Ohio Revised Code, and that's, that's just like I didn't write that. Um, <laughs> thank you to um, those from council who've uh, gotten uh, in touch with me about some additional suggested entities for the outreach plan. They're listed there, and um, then you'll also see um, I tried to mark up based on our discussion and some other feedback. Um, the um, excerpt of the code um, of regulations. And again, uh, we decided at the last meeting, I think that for the outreach conversations, we'd really only share the, the purpose statement. That would be the focus. 
So if you have any additional comments, um, uh, particularly about the purpose statement um, and, and the powers, although the legal language, you know, isn't tuned up there, the members, we can have it tonight or you could email me. But at this point, can, we can just focus on the purpose statement, right? Yeah, that would sure work that for me. Because yep. um, I think that would be... That's the most important thing. Yeah, I think I, that would be good to do. I, I had some, not change any of the words really, but change the sentence structure and the, where the words... I found it awkward the way it's written. The and purpose so, statement. Yeah, and so I was working with making some changes and I'd love to... I, I didn't write them out, I just... So, so it's not substantive, it's just... Right, it's wording. just changing, making making some different sentences and putting some phrases together because I, well, like I said, I think, I think in some places it's awkward and in some places it doesn't quite make sense to me. Okay. Do you want to just send that to me or we can yes. talk about it? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so I, because I think what we should do is sort of approve the substance so that we can move forward with those outreach meetings. Um, and, you know, so I think, you know, some wordsmithing, uh, as long as we all agree with the substance here. Judith? Yeah, I, I had meant to send you and forgot, Lisa, uh, the, an edit that I gave, that I had mentioned at the last meeting, and somehow I didn't get it to you. Um, so I wanted to just say it again. It's not actually very complicated, but the last two sentences, the YSCDC will advance economic community and commercial and civic development and I had said based in village values and annual goals uh, established by the village of Yellow Springs. Uh, I, I feel like that really connects values, the village values, it becomes totally connected to, uh, you know, what is, what is being advanced. And, um, rather than just saying the DIC supports them. Yeah. Uh, I would rather see it based in them. And then just get rid of strengthen the task base. Obviously, if you've got, you know, to grow and strengthen the task base, or you can add it on at the end. I don't know. Uh, that it's yeah, that, that is, was one of the phrases that I was going to yeah. rearrange. Yeah, because I think it's, you know, it's the values that are important. Uh, and, and I think putting the value, a value statement in there as a separate statement the village so, values. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a good recommendation to me. So do you need me to send that to you or you got it? I'll try to get it right. Um, but, I, but again, I think that's editorial. I mean, well, they to do me, it means something. To, the village to me, values. it means something different. It, 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 it more strongly links. I mean, you know, because the other thing says we're doing, we're trying to grow and strengthen the tax base. That's kind of that is the purpose, yeah. Um, versus that, you know, this development is based in, I see it as meaning something different, so that's. Right, well, I mean, because what that's emphasizing is that that's how it's guided is by those, um, so. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, if, if, if your first priority is growing the task base, you know, it, I mean, you might end up doing something that isn't gonna grow your tax base as much Right, and, and I mean, because I, I of your, it does, because of your values, I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, it so. does say it supports the village values and the annual goals, so maybe um, it's, I, I, I mean, I just it's not to... silent on the, I don't, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. I, I just think, I, what I hear you saying is you want that to be more centrally integrated in the sentence. Yeah, something. But it's not silent on it's the importance not of silent. village no, it's values. Just, yeah. That's the last sentence there. So do we need to bring this back again at the next meeting before we can start these outreach conversations? Have, did we have the uh, outreach conversation scheduled or tentatively no, scheduled? we haven't. I wanted to what, run this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that was, um, I think council approved that Lisa and I can move forward with those. Um, and we had, you know, indicated the entities that we were definitely gonna reach out to. Um, well, it doesn't sound like we're talking about anything substantive. So I think we can wordsmith it and, and I think it's a work in progress as well because um, those meetings should give us more to reflect on. Um, okay, so is council good with 
some wordsmithing and to move forward with this purpose statement? I am. Awesome. Okay. All right. And last piece of old business is a finance committee update. Yeah, this can citizen advisory board. Oh. No, that's that's not. No, finance. Yeah, that we oh, that's next. Sorry. Yeah. So I can be really quick. Uh, you know, there's a finance advisory committee. This is uh, bundled in with my other commission reports, and um, the investment review. I think Colleen actually has more detail in her report um, than I do about the shifting um, of investments, and then to the second bullet, um, we've begun to evaluate. Uh, critical legal service needs to kind of better understand our current fees and determine best options to properly budget for and manage costs given where we are in the year and given we're trying to get in front of understanding our financial situation given the discussions about an assistant solicitor and restorative justice and we just want to try to understand what our what our budget might be going into next year. So that's some of the conversations we've been having in that committee. And then maybe the other thing I'll add is the reference that Lisa made to updating the investment policy is uh, related to a comment that we made at the last meeting about uh, we think it's important for council to have a role uh, because you know we're seeing better return on investment um, by making some of these policy changes. So. Uh, currently, the investment committee does not officially have a council um, person, and so that will be something that we'll probably recommend in the future. Okay. All right. And now we are at new business, and uh, so we have the proposal about the Citizen Advisory Board um, from Lisa and Kevin. Right. So um, I'll also try to make this as, as quick as possible. Um, my intention of bringing this um, at this point, knowing that council is really just now being able to take in the report from the um, justice system task force, is to get uh, to establish some potential vision and ideas of what might be, even a very in a very imperfect way, to try to keep the momentum going forward. Um, in the end of the year, given that by the beginning, first of the year, we'll be maybe wanting to make some prioritizing decisions. Um, you know, looking at the uh, 2018 goals for a model village justice system, and also um, very informed and appreciative of the work within the justice system task force and reports from the justice system task force, I began to consider what might it actually look like to have some kind of an advisory board. Uh, a, a citizen said to uh, us in Justice System Task Force when we were talking about the challenges of establishing something like this, said, well, roll up your sleeves and do the work. <laughs> so I decided to try to do that and try to get something in writing. Um, the purposes of this would be to surface insights into community concerns about local policing that may be missed or silenced because of individual concerns about direct communication with the police department to somehow provide a neutral confidential and discreet process to intake complaints and provide in feedback to individuals from the community about their experiences with the police department to aggregate data about community concerns that lead to recommendations to the council, village manager, chief of police about process, training, community outreach, and that support our understanding of community policing <coughs> expectations and norms. We talk about community policing, but we haven't really defined it. And I think that it's a, a back and forth process to understand what the citizen concerns are and what the current practices are. And so hopefully this aggregate data about complaints will um, support a definition of community policing expectations that will continuously improve the degree of trust between the community, village government, and the police department. 
Um, I want to acknowledge that this very draft proposal is um, what you'll see in, in the Pat's report, more of a hybrid. Um, for example, Oxford, when you look at that report, you'll see Oxford. Um, elements of advisory boards do not typically include review of complaints. But it's very important and urgent, I think, for us to begin to understand and gather complaints from citizens as quickly as we can, um, even if our process evolves over time. So I was really trying to keep that issue about complaints um, front and center. You'll see as next steps, um, I was um, perhaps presumptuous to name the Village Mediation Program in this document. Um, before bringing this to council, I discussed this proposal with John Gudgel, who has been socializing it with members of Village Mediation with mixed reviews. Um, I've also discussed this with Chief Carlson and with Patty Bates, who I think are uh, favorable to the idea that gathering complaints from citizens and having a way to start to look at them is important and that we should go Go boldly and bravely. Um, I know I kind of get in trouble when I say I'm going to do things boldly. I've heard that before, but <laughs> here I am doing that again. Um, so I, I want to just talk through the high level initial process really quickly. But in terms of next steps, I think that in my idea, the council needs to digest and really think about the reports that Pat has presented. Um, maybe think about this idea at a high level. Um, I'm bringing this together with Kevin Stokes because you'll see that the HRC is implicated at this point in the process. But as a next step, um, I would like to um, work with Marianne to understand how the Village Mediation Program is feeling about this idea and what role they might possibly play as a stakeholder. And I'd like to return to Council on October 15th with an update. Let me talk just a little bit about a high-level process. Um, the idea is the intake is a citizen would bring a concern to a neutral entity, so not the council. Um, I do think that a commission could take the lead to define some scope documents and maybe a community communication plan. But again, the citizen doesn't bring the concern in my mind to a commission. They bring it to a neutral third party. For example, uh, imagine it was the village mediation program. These are, or some other people who are experts at listening, people who have a high degree of comfort with highly confidential issues, who can redact identifiers desired by the community member to protect uh, confidentiality and privacy there would need to be some sort of an intake process. Um, what I've learned and been very convinced by my work and listening to Pat and the Justice System Task Force is that the village of Yellow Springs does, is not big enough to be an investigatory body and that the investigation of these complaints should be done by Chief Carlson. I know that there are people who have concerns about having the investigation of a complaint taken on by the system of power. I understand that, but I think at this point, uh, if we want to get going and begin to have an understanding of complaints, it's appropriate to ask our chief to investigate those. You see that I'm suggesting that he would not delegate that investigation, but that he might do that himself. And I understand that there's capacity issues. We have no idea of the volume or the nature. So. That's just this idea here, and that then after the investigation, the uh, feedback would go back to that neutral third party. Um, I also am noting that this is a great opportunity for the chief to gather information to promote his continuous improvement that we know he's committed to in terms of defining community policing standards. At that point, you see there is a loop where the neutral third party provides feedback to the citizens. If the citizen is satisfied, then this would be closed. If the citizen is not satisfied, um, there could be an, 
opportunity to explore additional mediation, referral to other services, some other kind of restorative justice. Um, the HRC is in this as an entity who might receive redacted summary data um, for trend analysis and to make advisory recommendations to council. So that was quick. It's imperfect, but it's an idea for us to consider, I hope, as we take in the recommendations, or those are recommendations, but as we take in the report that is also in this packet from Pat. I would like to say that, yes, Lisa and Chief and I did discuss this, and Chief and I, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to speak for both of us, we are supportive of moving forward with this idea. Well, let's for, hear from the Chief. For further explore, exploration. Absolutely. And thank you, Lisa. Um, I would like to take this moment, opportunity to publicly remind um, our fellow citizens that my office door is open. Um, I will meet with you to discuss any discrepancies or issues that you have um, on your terms and I will follow your suggestions as far as what you would feel comfortable in uh, an investigation or me looking into. I share all public information that is available. Um, I offer it. Uh, what I, I can't do is answer to rumor and gossip on social media. So at that point, um, anything that, that I can do to continue the transparency and evolution in the department, I'm, I'm all for it. And I think that this, though it is simple in its conception, I think this has uh, excellent potential with um, bringing the department and the community closer together. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Chief. And I'd like to commend Lisa for doing the groundwork um, for putting this uh, draft proposal together. Uh, but in case someone was listening and might have misunderstood, um, Lisa did mention two council members that she's working with. Uh, but just to be clear, we're not, the three of us are not working together uh, at any given time. Uh, Lisa and I met briefly uh, with me as the liaison for HRC. Um, and as she suggested, she thought it was going to be a slam dunk with the village mediation program. So when the, she knew she had to spend more time working with village mediation and with uh, Marianne, I'm sort of stepping back. Uh, so that's just the two of them working together real time. I guess my question is the citizen advisory board to who or what? Um, citizen advisory boards generally are advisory to the chief of police police. This, it's not clear to me who, th who the advisory board's advising. So um, I see them as a leading to recommendation to the council, the village manager, the chief of police, example for process, training, and community. Um, Wait, so say, I, say I see, it's in the uh, proposed purposes third bullet. I don't see um, the aggregate data that would come out of this if, for example, it's redacted and summarized by the HRC. I think just as, uh, for example, data from Justice System Task Force has informed multiple stakeholders, I think that it could um, be recommendations about policy, could be to the council or to the manager. I don't see it as being to one entity. But again, just to draw. An advisory board to the council, the, council. the chief, mm -hmm. the mayor, the. Aggregated data about uh -huh. community concerns that lead to recommendations to the council, manager, and chief of police? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I think this sounds like a counterproposal to the Justice System Commission. And, uh, and I don't know. Uh, I know you had said it wasn't when I had asked you, is this mm -hmm. a counterproposal? It sounds like a counterproposal to me. So, and I don't know. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. It, there's something about the. I know it's partly, you know, your professional experience, how you talk about organizational things, but it's kind of hard for me to 
so it's just focusing at complaints. Complaints, and then understanding. So it's a different way, of, instead of a civilian review board. So this is an alternate to a civilian it's review a board. It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. Yeah. And what's the, it's a, it's a civilian <laughs> board, review board, and it's hybrid with what? It's hybrid in that it's taking in complaints. Yeah. which a citizen advisory board doesn't normally do. And then it's advising. And then based on the aggregate data of the complaints, uh -huh. may see trends that lead to recommendations. So I don't see okay. it as at all. Um, it, I think it's much more smaller. I mean, it's not small. It's very important, but it's uh, very focused around complaints and learning from complaints and taking actions based on the experiences of citizens. And I see that as a very different idea than what you prop okay. proposed. Well, proposing. I guess uh, the only trouble with the name particularly is I think it's going to be confusing to people because generally when I, th I don't know, what do you think, Pat? A citizen advisory board to me is, is a specific kind of thing. And when I looked it up, you know, when I saw that there was going to be this thing on the agenda and I didn't know what it was, mm -hmm. and I looked it up and I Googled it, it the first thing that came up was a long discussion about citizen advisory boards to chiefs of police, and it came from a chief of police journal. And so that's, I think it's going to be confusing, that title. I would say think? that traditionally and pretty widespread advisory boards are sort of what Judith is describing. They, they advise the chief of police. They work, their focus is primarily on creating better relationships between a community and a police department. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I totally support some way that citizens can make complaints outside of the police department for those people who don't feel, for whatever reason, that they can go to the police department. Um, and I also agree that it's the police department that must carry out the investigation. So it's just creating a, a process. And if the mediation service is willing to do that, it could be a special program mm -hmm. with a title, you know, heading of some kind, where people could, could come and make their confidential complaints. And, um, but I think it does get a little confusing if you have a commission and an advisory board and a program that is a complaint process. Mm -hmm. It's probably getting a little complicated. Um, Thank you. Um, and, uh, 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 yeah, name, I mean, and to your specific question about the hybrid, I was very informed by the section of the report that Pat prepared that I'm certain you've read a million times that talks about what they do in Oxford, where they, they don't do it. I, did you notice that I said that I read all their minutes? They never take in citizens. Oh, interesting, because it does say that they do, Which is a very even though they're advisory. It's very challenging to run any sort of citizen. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'd like to say, I, I, when I first heard that you were going to do this, well, you know, and I had suggested earlier that the mediation program and HRC might be involved in some way, but as I thought about it further, I'm thinking, we haven't defined the problem, so we're putting the solution before the problem, I think. And at council, people have come to your, we have not defined the problem at council. And part of it is who, I think, talking to, how do we get the information from the people who have complaints that aren't coming to the police department? That's, that is the because problem. Because why, I don't think we should set up a process if we don't know that it's gonna be used. So I think that one of the first things is, is to talk, I mean, we have someone sitting here who not only thinks that the police department is corrupt, but apparently maybe we're corrupt too. Now, we set up a process. Is a person like that going to participate in that kind of process? I, I think we need to have, have more of a conversation at council, maybe through HRC. I, I'm not sure how, but to say, okay, what is the problem? What, what are the problems? And ask people who to the degree that we can find what would work for you i mean is this the kind of thing what we're mm -hmm. you know you you I, I know one one person who has had a complaint with the police did not go to the police she would be a great person to say uh, what would work for you mm -hmm. and to get some of that kind of feedback before we set up a process so let me just speak to that i do not have a tremendous amount of ego investment 
in this particular design. What I'm passionate about is getting something out there for, as you say, you, the I, council to react to, the community I, I, react to. That's what I'm trying to do is just further the yes, work. Yes, I think yeah? that it's critical that we have some way. I think the issue of trust in the police department is critical and some way that people feel like they can have their voice heard. Mm -hmm. and, and that have that have an impact. <clears throat> so I don't know if I should ask Patty or Chief. <laughs> um, there's an ANAC student mm -hmm. who was doing some stuff. Mm -hmm. Do we know where we are? And so just so everybody's clear, um, there's an ANAC student who's doing a, Rachel Isaacson, who's uh, doing a senior project and her project is involved with gathering information using one me 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 mechanism or another uh, from citizens asking them, hey, how was your relationship? Have you had any interactions with police? How was it? You know, other minor demographic information. Um, is it too soon to expect any information from that or can the, someone? The last communication I had with Rachel was after the last council meeting, mm -hmm. um, uh, made some suggestions on the cards mm -hmm. um, that she needs for her project and how to go about getting those. And she is she's working on getting those cards so that she can begin her project. Okay. What is it? Say again what the I'm forgetting. I know it's something about gathering information. It's, ba it's based upon an about ACLU um, project they did in, was it New York? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And um, her idea is, is the, the idea starts with the premise of what was your for, first interaction with a police officer ever? Was it positive or negative? In what way? Uh, and then leading into conversations uh, with officers about local policing, she also wants to do some. Um, interviews on why so and potentially on channel 5 Spencer um, as part of the project and then to have this information readily available not only to the police department but to the public as a you know this these are the different ways people see things and understand things and, and try to increase that positive communication is that a good explanation, Miriam? Yeah, and yeah, I just had forgotten. So yeah. as a next step, this is what I, I would um, request. I think um, the, as a council, we have a lot of information that was in this packet to take in, all related to this topic. So I know we're going to do that. I know we're going to keep talking about this topic. What I would also like to do um, is to work with Marianne, who I know is an expert in conflict resolution, has a strong background in mediation um, and who is a liaison to VMP to start to explore some of these ideas, try to figure out how to get more maybe community input on these ideas and, and just keep coming back with some updates. Is that something that would be acceptable, Marianne, to you yeah. and the council? And what are we talking about with like timeline? Um, because, you know, at our last meeting we talked about there are a lot of justice system issues, right? Mm -hmm. And so now we're you know, kind of, yeah, we're building our <laughs> agenda. So what, what are you thinking as far as? Well, um, I, I am seeing, I know that, you know, Kevin made the point that the, the end of the year is, you know, maybe an artificial barrier, but I know that in terms of prioritizing our work and our capacity, we need to move forward on this as quickly, you know, as possible to even understand feasibility and balance it, I mean, because it is different. It's related to the justice system, but it's different than the commission. I agree with that. Yeah, I, I guess you, you said exactly what I'm thinking is, are we making this issue a priority? So. I mean, I, I see it as very consistent with the goal to establish a model village justice system that supports a just safe and welcoming community. Mm -hmm. I, so, and I also, I know the council hasn't heard this as much, but I have been really influenced by listening to citizen comments at the Justice System Task Force and feel that having some kind of a process, even if it's imperfect, 
to understand complaints is, is going to be important. But I don't know exactly. I just put something out there. I would like to work on it more with Marianne. Yeah, and I think I think it is a priority, uh, and I think the diff a difference is a lot of the other proposals are top down, and this is sort of bottom up. You know, hearing from the people first, and you know, it's not just it's not just make believe or premise that we're operating on that there are complaints and concerns, but it's a matter of actually fielding those concerns and then make having discussions and perhaps again aggregating that data and and allowing some decisions uh, to to come from that. So again, it's it's I don't think it changes or makes it a different priority. I think it's just a different approach to some of the other things we've been considering. Mm -hmm. I think it will have to evolve. And if we keep that awareness and the inception, an open mind, um, learn as we go, Well, I'm curious to hear more. Uh, Can I just one, say one last thing, please? Sure. Please. Yeah, I've please. spent some time researching this issue of, uh, and uh, I support the concept, and I think we do need to go forward with it. However, it is extremely difficult. There is, mm -hmm. there is basically no village, and very few small towns that have been able to do this successfully. Uh, because it involves a lot of legal issues, it involves uh, you know police standards, Ohio Revised Code. I mean, it's really a challenging process, and it, it's going to be difficult to make it happen quickly. And we know that the um, when, when did you have the process in uh, HRC? So there was a past process. There was a past attempt to do this, which <laughs> crashed. There, been many, there are many examples out there of people who've tried to do this and it crashes. So it's, it's something that you really have to, do, it's something that's going to take a lot of thought. And, that, and that's part of my concern that sure. some of the people who have complaints aren't making them or are making them on uh, Facebook, are they going to be satisfied by something that mm -hmm. gets developed? That's why I think we, it, we need to draw mm -hmm. in people mm -hmm. who who, and I don't know whether HRC is a good place to, to, to do that or somehow draw in people who were saying, I have, you know, I have complaints and this is what I think should happen. If they think what should happen is we should get rid of What's this officer or that officer or whatever, well, then, you know, But it's we'll the people who are hearing the complaints, I mean, the intake, just the intake, just to take in the complaint, those people have to be trained. I mean. You, I you mean, can't I just get a bunch of people and say take the take the intake of the complaint. They have to be have quite a bit of training about what kind of complaint is this, where does it go, what, and all the confidentiality. This is a small town. I mean, mm -hmm. it's big. It's a big thing to do. It's just, Could I just make one brief comment? I, I I understand everyone's concern. I I think that the important thing to talk about when we're talking about that this proposal is. The understanding, at least the understanding that I have, is that there are citizens out there who have complaints and concerns about the police department who are not comfortable bringing those complaints into the open publicly, particularly to the police department, but per perhaps also in any public manner. And I think the important part of this proposal is that it provides a private way to do that, a confidential way to do that, that still assures that somebody's going to take your concern or your complaint and look at it, and then somebody's going to get back to you and talk to you about it. And, and if, you're, if you're happy with the result or you're comfortable with the result, okay, then we've accomplished that. And if you're not, it gives another avenue to follow up and find that resolution. And, and if you're still not happy, you can always go the public route if that's how you feel. But until we try something, until we start it, we're not going to know if it works. And I think Chief's point of this is going to be something that's going to have to adapt over time is well taken because it is going to be hard and we are going to have to change and adjust and tweak and, as we go along. But um, we're not going to know if we don't start. You know, the the thing to me that worked in the past 
up to a point it worked pretty well, but it was, there was just kind of a, uh, was when Joan Chappelle was on HRC and people came to HRC with a complaint, say. And then, but the problem was, and then there was the, you know, well, you can't, at some point, citizens wanted to uh, tape, you know, videotape HRC, and of course, people didn't, the reason they were coming there was because they were, they didn't want to be public about it, and it, of course, that was a public organ, uh, public commission. But then what they tried to do, and I'm not sure why this got stopped, but I understand it got stopped by council, but I don't know why. Um, they tried to just, okay, two people on the commission, so that's not a, you know, doesn't require public meeting rules, uh, would meet with the person. And Joan would then go to the chief, who she had a good rapport with. She would talk with him. She would try to mediate whatever the problem was, maybe would be able to bring the person in, you know, with support to speak with the chief about a complaint, you know, whatever it was. And I think it worked, actually. It was just very simple. Nothing about flow charts and all that kind of stuff. Just very simple. And um, for some reason, so there was just, you know, people who had taken that on, they, and, and they did it pretty well. I think it was, it, it was somewhat effective. And they were known that people could go to them with a complaint if something happened that they didn't like with a police officer. And, you know, Joan had the trust of people. So um, to me, try, you know, I don't know. That's what I think of when I think of something that we could possibly do. Not that it would be Joan Chappelle, not that, you know, not that they wouldn't need some training, maybe, uh, in how it was done, but um, something kind of. Well, it sounds to me like the first thing, well, but uh, I don't know. the first thing that um, needs to be addressed is Mary Ann's yeah. point. Um, yeah. What is this going to really address the problem? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think. Patty, what you said in theory sounds great, mm -hmm. but I think there's a, a, a practical concern here that people will not avail themselves mm -hmm. of the system. And then the second thing that's super important is what Pat said about having the expertise to do this kind of thing. And I, I'm not convinced that we have anyone currently on HRC with those skills. Mm -hmm. um, village mediation, it sounds like maybe there are some people with the appetite. Um, and, and I do think Judith, that it can be simple. I mean, I think one thing I heard Lisa said is, you know, the idea is out there, so let's think about if, if we are going to move forward. Um, but I, you know, I, I am interested in hearing more, but I think the first piece is addressing Mary Ann's issue. The most important thing is going to be whoever those people are that they're trusted. That's the biggest issue, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to be. Whoever those people are, they're going to have to be trusted. And they're going to be, have to see, be seen as independent. I mean, they can't be seen as part and partial of the, the village organization. In a sense, they have to be independent. And so, uh, but that trust issue. And so it's going to, so media, the, me the group people in mediation potentially are some of those resources. Right, right. Um, but I think that's going to be the more important thing. And then getting some training and having, you know, a way to take complaints that's, you know, consistent. And then what's the next step kind of thing. Right. Okay. Well, it sounds like we're on the same page generally. All right. We just got to figure out where to go next. Um, okay. I am going to not postpone this topic again, but I'm going to just kind of give an overview because I did not put my two-pager in the packet. I apologize for that. But this is the Vote 16 initiative slash gun control proposals. And um, basically what I'd ask is that for the next meeting, um, everyone read through it carefully. But I just want to highlight a few things that um, I brought up. And I want to preface it by saying that we have a lot of nuts and bolts issues that we need to keep prioritizing. But I also think there's a constituency that we have to think about, which is our young people. And this is something that's really important to them. And I think that um, we have the potential to take the lead as a community. So vote 16 is simply the idea um, that you reduce the voting age to 16. DC is moving forward with this initiative. Since they are the District of Columbia, they can open it up to local and federal elections because they're like a state. 
There are about 10 states that are also looking at Vote 16 initiatives very carefully. And um, I have on the back suggested some things that if we have the appetite that we could do. This is the... Uh, okay, I'm, the I'm not kind of lost it here. Um, that oh, here it is. Got it. Got it? Got it. Yep. Okay. Thanks. So I would look at the potential, potential action steps, but um, similar to what we did with broadband, I think affiliating ourselves with an organization, one that I get a lot of emails from, Every Town for Gun Safety, might be an interesting one just to see what's out there. Um, but I think that it could be interesting for us to think about changing our ordinance, um, even though we can only affect local elections taking lead on something like this and advocating as, as you know, something that the state changes. Um, there's a lot of interesting research about how if you start people younger, they have better voting habits, and at the end of the day, starting to set a standard that elected officials need to listen to young people. Um, in terms of the gun control, it's a lot trickier because the state has effectively shut down local control in this regard. So even though we're a home rule state, we uh, cannot do very much. But it is very interesting because a Republican has introduced House Bill 585. And it is about the common sense gun control laws that um, so many organizations are talking about and even Governor Kasich is um, suggesting we support. So similar to things we've done in the past, I think it's good to um, make a statement about this um, and encourage our elected officials to, uh, to support, uh, again, what our Republicans put forward. But I think also we might want to think about joining up with the more progressive municipalities around the state and looking at a way to collectively advocate because it's so easy to you know, freak out when those school shootings happen and then we get caught up in everything else and then we freak out again and the reality is state and federal electeds are not doing anything. And so I think uh, similar to what we've done with state taking a stand on fracking and, uh, you know, on, on immigration, this is something that's worth a little bit of our time and I'm, I'm willing to take the heavy lift on most of these things. So. Yes. Thanks for doing this. Yep. So anyway, so next meeting, I thought I would just, after you've looked at it and digested it, see what feedback there is, and if we, as a council, have the will to do this. Um, and that's all I have to say so for it'll now. It will be in the packet for the next. Yes. Meeting. Yes. Great. Um, okay. Yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah. Very passionate about this, as I think we all are. Okay. Uh, proposal for the overhead projector. Yeah. So yeah, we were going to pull down the screen just to see what we're looking at. Okay, so what, what I would like is something that um, <coughs> is, works, functions. For example, we have a projector that's somewhere in the building. Sometimes it's found, sometimes it's not found. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So I'd like to have something here that works so when anyone comes and wants to make a presentation, they can hook up whatever they hook up to it and it works. Uh, secondly, I'd like to have something that people can actually see. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I can actually read that now, but whenever people have PowerPoints, like, you know, what you were doing, you, you can't see it. We have this huge screen here that does not get used. And thirdly, I'd like to have something that's well, reasonably cost-effective and easy to use, and uh, something that's three thousand dollars doesn't meet that criteria to me. <laughs> so I'm not sure what it is. Whether it's getting a bigger screen for the TV, I, I don't know. This is not my expertise, and Kevin and I talked about it a little. But surely it seems like we can have something so that council people and citizens can actually see what people are presenting and that when people come to present something, they are able to do it. And I'm not sure where to go. Kevin, mm -hmm. do you know? Well, yeah, I, I think I would agree with you that the proposal that we have in the packet is, is sounds a little high. Um, I think it doesn't itemize all of the hours necessary. And I think if we, we could even go through, and I don't want to do it right now, of course, but uh, if we were to go through and sort of piecemeal the individual steps here, uh, like an electrician to put an outlet up there, um, 
And if you hadn't just said our projector that we have sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, I would have said, well, why don't we start with that one? Um, I think it's 3,600 uh, lumens. It's a very uh, bright and powerful uh, projector, but what it also says here is that it's going to project on the wall. So, you know, there's things to consider, and I don't know if the people who have put this together have been in this room, but there's things like throw rate, like how far does the projector have to be from the wall or whatever screen is projecting on. But it sounds like this one is powerful enough where almost anywhere you put it in this room is going to be bigger than that screen. Uh, on the wall. So there's lots of little detailed things I think we can go through. So um, and we who, did briefly talk. Where is a place where we can take this problem and have it solved? Uh, well, just get some other proposals. Um, and the Patty, do you want to? Well, so Judy's been working on it. I, mm -hmm. my, my thing was, you know, flat screen TVs are really cheap right now. And maybe the thing is that that television isn't large enough. Because when you show the screen up there, you know, and, and I agree with you, Marianne, sometimes it's difficult to read. Um, but perhaps simply a larger TV, which would be substantially less than what you see here, um, would solve the issue. Maybe not. It would be something we would have to look at. The other thing is, generally the problem with the projector that we have when it doesn't work is because the laptop that the person is trying to connect to it is not compatible because it's too old. Generally when Judy hooks something up to this, she's What's able too to old? Their, their equipment or ours? The adapters okay. on there. Okay. And so, and obviously we can get the adapters to you know, mm -hmm. connect right. with any computer or have a laptop that's standard. Right. I mean, I guess that's what I wonder is why I mean, because the current projector has worked in every situation that I've been in, um, so why not use that? I, I mean, I just want to be able to see things. Okay. <laughs> so, Judy, any reason that we wouldn't use the current projector? You can. Be my guest. I mean, you will trundle the cart in. It will bang and crash and rattle across the floor and you will, I mean it, it's just a matter of how good do you want to look while you're doing your presentation basically. <laughs> I mean you can do this and it takes a while and every single laptop you hang, you hook it up to there's that embarrassing three minutes while you try to figure out if it's actually going to work and this way connects differently than the last time and that's how that technology is um, as opposed to a device that is much more modern and you can throw your flash drive in and it's more like a laptop where it's consistent each time and not quite as embarrassing a three minute period and not so much rattling and banging across the floor with your ugly rolly thing but you know you can say well let's get a nice modern rolly thing and let's get a little bit of a better projector and let's get it I mean you can sure I mean you could go at this any number of different ways but it, it would require somebody saying you know what I am willing to spend a bunch of time and go to Best Buy and do the thing and do the research. I mean, it's time. It's just time about, well, does this one work for you? No, it's not quite exactly what happened. How about this one? Do you need it ceiling mounted? Do you want it interactive? Does mm -hmm. it need to play on Channel 5? These are questions I cannot answer for you. So somebody's got to say, these are all the things I, I have got to have something that does all of these things in this way. Otherwise, you're going to get a fairly generic proposal because every one of you wants something different each time you do a presentation, yeah. quite frankly. And, and, and you're right. To, the, to that point, I mean, I don't know if the presentation I did was showing on Channel 5, uh, but this proposal would not allow what's being viewed to be on Channel 5. Well, is this something you're willing to take on? Sure. <laughs> Okay. This is your expertise. Yeah, yeah. The, the, so, for the record, I don't feel like I could say no. So, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start. Let's start with, in the short term, let's see if we can use the uh, existing projector, whatever. Do you know, do do, do we, we want it ceiling mounted? No. Nope. You don't let's want. Just, to... Let's just start with what we've got. Start using that. If it doesn't work, then we can get a newer projector. Okay. Um, so just make sure we have the adapters or get a laptop that's dedicated. And if we need a less rattly cart, let's do that. <laughs> okay. <Definitely>. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then ceiling mount maybe in the future. Okay. Um, okay. 
Uh, Judas resignation. Um, okay, so Marianne, you asked to discuss that a little bit. Well, I she could retract it though. <laughs> yeah. I know what we'll do. We'll say that we're not going to vote for the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, until, no, until, no, no. Until, <laughs> until, <laughs> and it's and not April first. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we're not kidding. Force you to say. It. Well, if that doesn't work, <laughs> then we have to have some kind of process for deciding. And there is a there is a sixty there day is a usual clock process, isn't it? that days. starts. We have to make a decision in sixty day within sixty days after she's of, no longer of it being so announced it could yeah, or leaving. Be someone starting next year. Is that it's sixty days from December. today. From today. So, so Chris, today the first day. I mean, you've announced it. So that's the sixty days from today. Okay. Middle so what? Middle of November. So yeah, are are there I mean are there existing rules that? No. Oh, so it's not. Well, I announced it to the end of this well, November. Does that make sense? Yep. She has to look up some of the stuff while we're sitting oh. back there. Okay. Um, under the uh, the section 12 of the charter governs vacancies. Um, the uh, the council will appoint someone. It has to be by a three to one vote. The person has to be an elector, a registered voter of the village, um, and then that person would run at the next, or there would be an election held at the next general election, so November 2019, which I think would coincide with when the term expired anyway. I think that that's just a coincidence that uh, works out well. Um, but, the, uh, but the charter does say 60 days. Now. Today, tonight, you've announced your intention to resign. Um, I don't know if that's a, a formal resignation. In other words, nothing's been presented in writing. Um, the uh, what so does it say? Is it say sixty days from the resignation? I have to go. I'd have to pull that okay. up. I mean, it, I've been on the council when there's been resignations. Usually, they announce and leave immediately. So right. that's uh, why. I was, so usually, but, you know. But, but, but what is I'm your intention? But my intention was to stay on till the uh, end of November. But like I said, I wanted to see the Second. commission, the commission, you know, discussion t to come to an end. So whenever that is, that's. And I thought, and I know what council has done in the past is they've put an ad in the paper, they've, you know, let, and people have expressed interest, sent letters of interest. That's how we did it wow. in the past. And then council and executive session, they went like that. Oh, okay. um, is how it was done. The, the charter so. simply says that the vacancy will be filled within 60 days. Oh, okay. So I'm not gone yet. All right. Well, I guess so I don't think, that, I don't think we should put any ad out there until the, your spot is vacant. I, that's my recommendation. Mm. So, I, because I, I think, uh, well, partly because there was, you know, there was a situation before where um, council took, went through this process, and then nothing ever came about. Um, what happened? What do you mean? Um, the person didn't leave. Yes, it was Judith. So Judith had mentioned that you might be leaving, and council took um, uh, application, so to speak, and nothing. Yes, because I I submitted uh, a letter of interest. So I don't because I, I mean I think we can make the decision if we've got sixty days. Then I mean I think that's enough time to. Yeah. Okay. I, I think the cleanest thing, <clears throat> excuse me, would be for you to you know, submit right a, a former statement. It they says I'm I'm resigning effective with a date. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I think that's the and that date, which sounds like end of November, would start the 60 day. Well, I, I mean, I think that that would be if you have you, that advance yeah. notice. You know that there's the, the vacancy will exist on X date. I think that you could ha take steps to prepare for that. Sure. Well, you know, the, the simple suggestion is that the next council meeting is on October the first. And if Judith were to submit a resignation, a formal resignation on October the 1st, that would take her through the end of November, which is what she's asking for, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, perhaps at the next council meeting, 
um, there could be prepared a potential ad to go in the paper or something that could be in a package for council to look at. And if Judith brings her formal resignation and submits it to council at that time, then that would start your 60-day clock, and you could go from there. Yeah, it's just, it seems like the timing would work out perfectly since the meeting is October 1st. Okay. Right. It, which I, I think, Judith, I heard you say is that you would not participate in that, that selection process. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, at least that's the way I think it's meant to be. It's meant to be. That's the way it's meant to be because it expects a, a vote of three to one, which would be the existing council. Okay. So then let's prepare. Um, I mean, it, it, it will just be a simple ad, I think. I mean, we don't have to. Um, that they, that we need to make clear that they have to be a registered voter. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, Judy Kittner, you're going to do that? Oh, yes. Okay. That's what I'm going to do. Cool. That's what I'm do. Okay, um, so manager's report. Um, so the only thing that I'm going to cover just real quickly is um, that I will next week be gone to the International City County Management Association Conference in Baltimore. Uh, I have some really interesting uh, sessions scheduled on affordable housing, Airbnbs, implicit bias, uh, all kinds of fun things, and a free behind the scenes tour of Camden Yard, which mm -hmm. as a baseball fan really excites me. Um, so <coughs> I'll be gone, Johnny will be here. Um, I will be out, I leave Sunday, I come back very late Wednesday, so I'll be in the office Thursday and Friday. And I, I will be working remotely, so um, I'm not going to put my out of office on the on the computer. Um, I will be checking emails and things in the evenings. Okay. Um, oh, and I wanted to thank you for the analysis about the electric rates. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was yeah. very important <coughs> to remember this. Uh, it's not apples to apples, and right. it's not yeah. as simple as as we might think. Yeah. I thought, also thought it was interesting, by the way, if you look at the bill that. DPNL does elect to take out money for efficiency and conservation programs. So, contrary to the idea that it's all free choice with DPNL, they take that money from every customer. Well, and, and, and I think everybody also needs to remember that they get to recoup all those capital costs every five years, and that's not something that's readily available in their rates, they have to apply for it, and, and, and they do it once, a, once every five years. They're allowed by law and they do it, regular as clockwork, just like all the power companies. I think you should actually, I'm wondering, you know, it's in your report, but citizens aren't going to hear that, and you've said them some bits and pieces, but I thought it would be useful for Patty to actually present that earlier, maybe in a meeting mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, just that DPNL, that thing about, you know, the cost, I thought it was interesting. Yep. Yeah, we'll, we'll think about yeah. how, how that would fit. Yeah. Um, Chris? Uh, well, even though the mayor's court piece has uh, been taken off the agenda, I just wanted to point out, uh, mm. since the camera's here, that the, the primary piece of that was is just to reiterate the police officer issue of how to charge if someone's going to be arrested, because there's an economic consequence to that. Who's going to pay for the, while the person's in jail. If you charge under the local ordinance, it's a local cost that the village would have to incur. Um, if you charge under state ordinance, then the county's got to bear that cost. I, I'm unaware of any municipalities, now I haven't done a deep dive, but 25 years ago, all of Montgomery County's jurisdictions went to that model where if you're going to summon somebody into court, you charge under the local ordinance, and that way they also capture a little bit more of the fees, the court costs, and, and other parts of that. So that's, that's one of the, the I, I hate to use the terminology, but it's really what it is, is one of the games that's played um, because of the, how the state functions with, with money. Um, the second part is not on the, uh, the solicitor's report. I just want to give an update on the surveillance ordinance. Um, Alice and I have had a chance to speak. Jennifer uh, Grewey has been involved in this. We uh, had a, a third conversation today. Uh, Ellis is tweaking some language. We're tweaking some language, but we're very close. We expect that will be presented to council uh, at the next meeting. All right. Thanks. Um, Judy. I've got nothing. We finally hired an assistant uh, to both for both me and for Denise, so that's great. All right. Good. Um, anyone want to highlight anything with Board and Commission reports? Judith? I did in that the, uh, a member has been recommending additional sites for additional solar to offset Cresco. Um, 
that would be installed by the village. Um, and this is Dan uh, Rudolph, and he, he had put this little report together of possible sites, and I know staff looked at it, and you know, they didn't think all the, I don't know that they thought any of the sites would be appropriate. But he had uh, sent out to the Energy Board's members again that he wants to, you know, be looking at that with the Energy Board. Um, and I just, you know, I'm, I wanted to give council, I wanted to give council um, an opportunity to provide guidance because I don't want citizens doing work if we're not going to take up those recommendations. Mm -hmm. So I, so, th so I don't know. Um, we have a meeting this week, and I guess I should have brought this up earlier, but I, I just got this in an email uh, recently. Um, so that was, yeah, that was, and then the, the other issue I just wanted to be clear on is with the Roundup program and what we're asking the Energy Board is to pro provide some resource for the applicant uh, who is using the Roundup program to come into the home and talk to them, uh, to, to get a group of people who would be able, would have the expertise to advise people on ways they could reduce their energy and yeah. their utility I, bills. I think but, energy audit is a good way to describe it. Well, the thing with it, the, here's my question though. The, an energy audit often in, uh, <coughs> includes recommendations that cost money. And mm -hmm. if the person's having trouble paying their bill, so that's why I wanted to get a little more guidance from you. I mean, I could imagine someone, you know, a little group of volunteers who, if the person is open to it, we said we couldn't mandate it, would meet with, you know, somebody who's been a recipient of the Roundup funds for one of their bills, say. So, um, they go in and kind of talk to them about their energy use. They have a, or maybe they have a, a, a little, you know, form that they go over and then provide some, is, I'm, I'm just sort of trying, I want to be able to bring to the committee, what are we asking them? Are they, then they, they kind of advise them because an energy audit often incurs costs. Mm -hmm. Right, I think that so. ultimately the best way to yeah. invest utility roundup and other funds is to make those changes. I think that's the direction that but we I'm, should be I'm, thinking. So you, you're wanting the board to maybe get some people who know how, who think about these things and have knowledge to meet with the homeowner or the family, whatever, and talk to them about their energy use and advise them on how, ways they can reduce their bills. Is that correct? But like I say, an energy audit generally costs people a, right. a fair um, amount of and money. I think so that's that, not, and I think we so should think about, but I think we should think about finding money to support that kind of activity, because that's ultimately addressing the problem, right? A one-time like covering somebody's bill. Okay. Yeah. So. But I, so. Not tonight. So that's we, part of it yeah, for I'm me. Right. When I've thought about that's part of it, then the other was just for them to think about sort of like what you were just doing. You were just brainstorming about what forms might it take. Mm -hmm. Like, is there a range? Like, is there a low end? I mean, I know that there's people in the community that have passion around this that could get involved. Like, what is, what forms might that take? And have them brainstorm just as you were. And I think mm -hmm. to the high end would be what, what Brian was suggesting. And when we had Utility okay. Smart, we used to take, you know, add an additional amount to people's, everybody's bill. And that money was then what we, I mean, it wasn't a very successful program in my mind, but it did contribute to people being able to change out their light bulbs mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it, it was a dollar forty per customer, mm -hmm. and it per went, month, per month, per month, mm -hmm. and it went um, to um, rebates and light bulb purchases and things like that. And I think the educational component is what yeah. we thought would be a basic start <laughs> of it, and and perhaps. The first one of the first phases could be finding someone to provide that ed educational component, um, and, and then if you know, continue, you know, move up the scale if needed. You know, and so. as part of the housing initiative, and looking at affordability, one of the possibilities that can come out of that is um, practices, resources, even funding grants, whatever to go toward different kinds of rehab, um, different kinds of energy conservation things for existing, <coughs> in existing homes, mm -hmm. that would be. Okay, but you're not, so, okay, and so 
fine. So we'll talk about that. Patty, are you coming to that meeting? Yeah, Johnny and I will be there okay. tomorrow night. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, but is council, uh, in, so, you know, this proposal that Dan has been thinking about, you know, increased solar, do we want our energy board to be looking, I mean, he's already put a little proposal together and I thought I was going to maybe bring it at some point, but, um, or just possible sites, sites the village owned. It partly, I think those were all sites village owned, right? No. Oh, no, it no wasn't they're not. They're, okay. not. they're not all sites the village but owned. There was a lot, that, there were several that were village owned yeah. sites. And, you know, and, and so. some of them, some of the, one of them may work. But the point with more solar right now is um, staff, will, staff will recommend against more solar right now. And the reason that we will is, is twofold. First of all, we don't have enough time under our belt with the array that we have to understand fully what it's going to produce over time. We, it, that is a contract. It is a contract just like every other contract we have to purchase energy. It ties us in at a certain rate for the length of that contract. The good part of it is we eventually have the ability to buy that array and own it ourselves and that would make it much cheaper. But the problem is that the energy, this is the second part, the energy that we buy off of that is more expensive because it's green, because it's a contract, than what we buy off the grid. And right now with the affordability in the village being what it is, and the fact that we purchase, depending on who you talk to, 88 to 93 percent of the energy that we use were tied into contracts. Staff does not feel it's a good idea to enter into another contract at this time that commits us to yeah. paying and a higher price than off the market. So, so if, if council's in agreement with that, and then, you know, the question is, does it make sense for them to do any research for at some point in the future? So I don't, I don't know. I'll, well, and things, I just, the research you do now, I understand why you're asking, Judith. It's just there's all this. this it will change. Yeah. yeah. It will, the research, if you do it now, it will be different will, a year from now be because relevant. it will okay. evolve too quickly. I mean, I think in general, and I think about this with the Citizen Advisory Board too, we need to keep on thinking about capacity in terms of staff time and cost. And that's something we didn't talk about with the Citizen Advisory Board, how much that could potentially cost us in terms of legal services and other things. So we got to remember to always ask these questions if we're going to make these priorities. Okay. Anything else? Um, I just wanted to highlight real quickly something that was buried in mine, which is uh, at my MVRPC meeting, the Miami Valley Military Affairs Association, which is a group that tries to connect um, citizens with uh, our you know, uh, military folks, uh, like selected officials to be a part of that. If anyone's interested, um, Judy has the form to join. Okay, Lisa. Uh, yeah, I have a couple things. Um, Art and Culture Commission, the commission accepted an updated mission statement. I'd like to read it very quickly. The Art and Culture Commission supports the mission of the Village of Yellow Springs in facilitating, promoting, and recognizing that public arts add value by providing educational opportunities, activism, economic sustainability, and an improved quality of life. The Commission navigates and connects our creative community and the arts community with the village government. So, Lisa, and I think it sounds great. So, is this then a recommendation for updating the ordinance then? Is yes, that what? Okay. it is. And I also know that um, there's things like letterhead and website and things like that. So, okay. So, then. Um, do you want that brought to the next meeting? Um, whenever, um, or, or yeah, possible. whenever it fits. Okay. And the other things that I'd like to update are also um, really related to agenda planning. Um, the first is that the Wheeling Gaunt Mural and Sculpture Project is moving forward. It's very exciting. We heard a fantastic presentation, and I'd request that council set aside some time on October 15th um, to hear a presentation about this project. It's a big project for the village. And so then, a special report? Yeah, a special report Okay. from that committee. 
And then uh, economic sustainability, um, we've turned now to the goal of um, uh, attend an attraction and marketing strategy for the CBE. And uh, there are already some ideas about needing some outside marketing and help with rebranding. And to your perfect segue point about cost and um, resource needs, I'd like some time on the agenda. It could probably be pushed out if you wanted to, but just to talk with council about what's going on in the ESC and what we're percolating there so council stays with us and we're doing the right thing. Great. Anything else? That's it. Um, Judith? I was just going to say, Patty, do, was there anything on the Library Commission? I mean, it's been a couple months ago when we had that meeting. It was just little repair yeah. issues. and we, um, Yeah, we're working on most of the small maintenance and repair issues. Um, Carl and Johnny and I have been trying to set a meeting with the architect on the revised drawings for the uh, handicapped accessible unisex bathrooms. Unfortunately, with me being in and out of town and Carl, it's been difficult to set that, but we're moving forward. Um, I think, okay, are we moving into future agenda items? I think we need to understand a couple things. Um, the finance report had some interesting things in particular about the fact that we're way over budget on, um, uh, what is it, R, I wrote it down, way over budget on wages, you know, yeah. So yeah, it was wages, maintenance, and professional services. So there was a note that Colleen made. It seems like we need to talk about that. Um, For next meeting, you mean? Po probably. Well, and we have a budget uh, presentation at the next meeting. Okay. It could be for 2019. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I'd like to have some input into how we do the budget. I mean, not just have it be presented. Right, right. Um, okay. So maybe Colleen can come to our next meeting? Yep. Okay. Um, I, I will be missing the next meeting, so the justice of the commission. Okay. She's yeah. going We'll do that. Um, okay. Yeah, and then I had a couple other things about the pool and about the lodging tax, but those will come with the budget. So uh, anything else related to future agenda items? Just on the budget, I think the, the pie chart on the general fund is a really easy way for citizens to understand how the money's being spent, and I would ask that yeah. that be part of it. It's just, you just see it right there. You know, I think that's very helpful. Because it's a complicated, it's such a complicated discussion, and you know, it's a lot of paper. But that kind of helps people just think this is where the money's really going, and kind of understand that. I, I would hope that on the 15th, the Housing Advisory Board could have a recommendation about goals. Housing goals. Okay. Anything else? All right. Well, we talked about a lot of other things throughout the meeting, which I know Judy's got notes on. Mm -hmm. um, so if there is nothing else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. So move. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.